We're recording. Please go ahead. Hi. It's May 6th, 2024, and this is a regular meeting of the town council. The open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present. However, I want to note that there are seven of us in the room and several counselors are remote. Um, the meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media, Channel 9, and in their live stream. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the May 6th regular town council meeting to order at 631. And I'm going to now take roll and ask counselors to indicate that they um, can hear us and we can hear them. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Councilor Ette. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Councilor Haneke. Bob Hagman. Present. <laughs> Councilor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Here. Councilor Ryan. I'm present. Kathy Shane. I'm here. Thank you. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. Councillor Walker. I have not seen her yet. Okay. There's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. To make a comment or ask a question, please re re use the raised hand button. If technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, we'll decide how to address that at the time. Um, it does mean that this discussion could be suspended if we have to. Um, there will be a one general public comment period tonight. Um, and it will include anybody who wants to comment on anything and on the items on the agenda, including um, the Amherst Hills. The order of the agenda is the same as posted. However, I want to call to attention the fact that we do not have all of the materials in a motion for Amherst Hills. So we are going ahead with that agenda item tonight in terms of a presentation and any questions, but we will not be taking the vote until next uh, on the 20th. We didn't receive all the final materials we needed in time for the legal counsel to review it and formulate the correct motion. Um, let me just mention a couple upcoming meetings. Um, first of all, we will meet again as a council on May 20th. Um, and then on May 21st, we will have a public hearing on the FY25 budget. The public hearing will be totally virtual. Um, and in addition to that, we have several other committee meetings that are happening throughout the month. Uh, but I wanna call particular attention to the fact that the finance committee will begin reviewing the budget. And in doing so, they meet on Tuesdays at two o'clock and on Fridays at 10 during the entire month of May. Um, the Town Services and Outreach Committee is having a special listening session regarding Heatherstone Road, and that is on Monday, a week from now, May 13th at 6.30. I also want to mention a couple of community events. Jewish American Heritage Proclamation Reading will be tomorrow at 4.30. If the weather's nice, it'll be in Sweetser Park. If it's not, we'll be in this room. Amherst College store ribbon cutting is on Tuesday, May 14th at 9 a.m. in the morning. The Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month event is on Sunday, May 19th at 11 on the Town Common or in the event of rain at the Amherst Regional Middle School. And the District 1 meeting will be on Sunday, May 19th at 3.30 at the North Amherst Library Community Room. We just dedicated our, we just did the ribbon cutting on that building addition this past week. Hi. 
<laughs> Alicia, can you just push your button and say, yes, I can hear you. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much. So all counselors are present with us this evening. So we're going to move on to general public comment. Anyone, anyone wishing to speak who is in the town room, if you have not done so at, up until now, please do sign up with Athena O'Keefe. She is over here. If you are on Zoom and you wish to make public comment, please raise your hand now. Right now, I'm only seeing two people on Zoom. If you're on Zoom and you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand now. Okay. I'm gonna have a 15. 15. Okay. Public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the town council resident are, are welcome. Residents are welcome to express their views, in this case, for two minutes. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment, and public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council. The First Amendment broadly protects individual rights to address the government, to speak, and to express themselves, including their right to say hateful and offensive things. I am generally unable to shut those co commenters down under the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution unless their level of speech falls within an exception articulated by the courts, such as fighting words, true threats to a particular individual, harassment of a particular individual, or incitement of imminent lawless activity. If a question exists as to whether a particular speaker is engaging in unprotected speech, I must defer to the principles of freedom of speech. With that, we will recognize speakers in the order in which they have signed up, and we will rotate between Zoom and in person. There are three people on Zoom, Let's start with the room. Nina Menken, please come up and state your name and where you live before you make your comment. Thank you. Hello, counselors. My name is Nina Menken. I live in Amherst, Mass. in North Amherst. Thank you for your service. I am here to talk about the increase, the proposed increases in the different departments in this upcoming budget with a very strong request that uh, the education budget for the regional schools not be any less than any other department. Um, I am also, there was recent information that's been passed along to us about um, an unofficial audit done by high school students of the budget in which they have identified a significant amount of additional funds that were in the budget as duplicate funds. This is in the amount of upwards of $2 million. And I am asking that if these funds actually do exist, that education be prioritized in looking at our town. We are about to bring in a new superintendent and I am hoping that we can move across departments to be able to support that person in succeeding. I see um, really disturbing siloing across departments in this town as I've experienced watching people uh, discussing the education fund. I understand that our schools are, are um, demographically getting smaller. And I ask that we all look at this problem from a systemic point and stop slashing things to try to just meet a budget. Um, and I, again, thank you so much for your hard work. And I, I, I ask you to not cut the education budget more than you possibly can and to prioritize it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Ken Rosenthal. Please enter the room, state your name, and generally where you live. Thank you. 
I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live at 53 Sunset Avenue. I want to compliment and thank Sunrise Amherst for having a critical review of the budget. Sunrise Amherst is a group of local public high school students who live in Amherst, and I think they have done a wonderful job, and it's very encouraging to see their interest and their work. I also want to take this opportunity to go on record in thanking Hilda Greenbaum for her wonderful donation to make it possible to have the renovation at the North Amherst Library. Paul Bachelman revealed her name at the ribbon cutting last week, and we were all so pleased to know that it was Hilda who made that possible. It's a wonderful, wonderful library. I'm sorry Hilda was not there for illness, and I just wish her well. Another person who was absent, I believe, and I could be corrected, is the executive director of the library who was not present for the ribbon cutting at her own North Library branch. I hope she is well. I'm sorry she was not there. It's a place where she should be to receive the compliments of all of us for the work done on the North Amherst Library. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you for joining us, Ken. We'll go back to the audience. Vince O'Connor. I'm Vince O'Connor. I live at 175 Summer Street, apartment 12. Um, I'm here to speak briefly about the need to fund education. First, although the Senate budget is not, won't be out till tomorrow, if, as I understand it, the increase in per pupil aid is included, it will result in 70 to 90 additional thousand dollars to the elementary schools for chapter 70. That money comes into the town. I hope that in the spirit of supporting libraries, the council and the manager will see to it that that money is directed to rehiring uh, paraprofessionals for all of our elementary school libraries so that the resources of those libraries will become um, available every day to all students. With regard to the regional budget, I urge the council to approve the 6% increase uh, proposed and voted on by two of the towns and likely by the time the council meets again by three of the towns. Um, I also would ask that in the spirit of welcoming the new superintendent, our first outside superintendent in a number of years, that the town council consider making a gift, a one a one year gift of four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars to avoid any budget cuts at the regional level, uh, staff budget cuts. So. Uh, those are the two things that I think are most important to focus on need education. To wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. I want to warn the audience, if you continue to make noise, we will take a pause, and that will just delay people's opportunity to speak. Thank you. We'll go to uh, Bridget Hines. Please enter the room, state your name, and where you live. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Oh, perfect. Excellent. My name is Bridget Hines. I live in District 5, and um, I'm here tonight in my role as the representative from Amherst Regional School District. The Regional School District um, School Committee passed the fiscal year 25 budget with an increase of 6%. We felt strongly as a committee that any level below that would not allow us to uphold the mission and goals at the heart of the Regional School District to an inclusive excellence. For people distant from K through 12 education, there may be a lack of awareness, but we're in the middle of an exceptionally difficult time for students, teachers, and schools. As my Amherst School Committee colleague, Deb Leonard, who's in the Schools Daily pointed out, pandemic learning loss is not a thing of the past. Large learning loss gaps remain nationwide and in Amherst Regional Schools we see gaps in algebra, geometry, and reading 
challenging texts, building arguments, problem solving, et cetera. In addition, the CDC shows national mental health crisis in teens and preteens. And at the same time, locally, we're facing um, record teacher shortages. We saw this recently when Chicopee School Committee voted mid-contract raises because they couldn't feel, fill teacher and leadership jobs. And then in Amherst specifically, we all know the regional schools are facing, facing morale that's really low in the face of several simultaneous, simultaneous crisis and multiple levels of leadership loss. Yet the cuts here in the town manager's budget would yield a 12% decrease in the regional district's teaching staff. That includes guidance counselors, school counselors, restorative justice, support for students who are failing in math and science, and some doubling up in AP sections as well. Our partner towns are pitching in, and um, I would just very much like to ask this committee to ask the Amherst town manager to also pitch in as well. Um, Bridget, we can talk more about your the time details, is up. but I really think that it's important that this committee look at it closely. Thank you. Thank you. we we'll go back to the room. Kathleen Mitchell. Hi, my name is Kathleen Mitchell. I'm a resident of district five with two children in the schools. I'm frustrated to be here again tonight speaking in support of the school budget, even after students, parents, educators, our interim superintendent and our school committee members. The people who best understand our schools and their needs have told you that 4% is not adequate. Amherst is still proposing 4% to the school budget. Even after Shutesbury and Leverett have offered 6% and the Amherst Police Department has been allocated 6%, the schools remain stuck with a 4% increase. I understand that the situation is complicated and that there are difficult decisions to be made. But I also know that the school budget crisis is not a problem created by the Amherst superintendent or the school committee. If you meet with Joe Comerford and Mindy Dom, as I and many other parents have, they will tell you that the majority of school districts in the state are in similarly difficult situations through no fault of their own. As a community, we cannot put the onus on our schools to solve this problem alone. And I think what worries me almost as much as my immediate concerns about the future of my kids' education is that I'm not sure that all of you understand the gravity of the situation facing our schools or feel a responsibility to come together to help fix it. Some of the comments that I have heard from town councilors and finance committee members over the last two months have come across as condescending and, and unsympathetic. The tone of these comments is one that I have not heard with respect to other municipal departments or capital projects that have been in need of additional funds. This has been extremely disheartening at a time when it has become clear that ensuring that our children continue to have access to high quality education is going to take a commitment from all of us. I hope that you will reconsider the increase allotted to our schools and work in partnership with all of us to show our kids that they matter. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Catherine. We're going to go to back to Zoom for the last person to comment there. Tony Cunningham, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Thank you, Tony Cunningham, District 1. So I wanted to speak about two uh, issues, and they're related. One is I'm disappointed to see that the Jones Library Building Project is not on your agenda tonight for presentation and discussion. And uh, there's nothing in the council packet about this project, nor is there a packet for the Jones Library Building Committee, which is scheduled to meet within 24 hours. The capital budget shows $1.1 million going toward this project in the next year. And that's money that comes from property taxes that could be redirected to operating budgets, such as the regional schools. Uh, looking at the, the proposed budget from the town manager, I see departments within the town getting increases beyond 4%, and yet the regional schools and the elementary schools are told to keep within 4%. There don't appear to be any cuts to municipal staffing, and yet we're hearing many, many cuts at the schools that are necessary. So I'd love this council to review this budget with a fine tooth comb and find the money to reach the 6%. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Tony. Back to the room. Jesse Ferris. Jesse Ferris of Hopbrook Road. Members of the council, I'm here today to voice my support for acceptance of the roads of Amherst Hills as public ways. I hope you will do so today or on the 20th, as the case may be. And as you do the right thing for the residents of Amherst Hills, 
I urge you also not to delay in accepting Hopbrook Road and Kestrel Lane as public ways, and so end a 20-year saga that only you have the power to resolve. Let me also take this opportunity to correct an error that was made at the last meeting held on this issue concerning the town's responsibility for our predicament. I stated incorrectly, as it turns out at the time, that the town had somehow failed to collect $100,000 in surety bonds from the developer. The truth, as I have since found out, is somewhat more straightforward. Let me read to you from the minutes of the town planning board meeting of June 18th, 2003. New business, escrow release, the meadows at Amherst Fields. Mr. Douglas Cole told the board that most of the work had been completed, requesting release of approximately $100,000, leaving approximately $30,000 to cover the remaining work. Town engineer had put together a punch list with a recommendation that $31,000 would be appropriate to cover the remaining work. Mrs. Connie Kruger of 15 Hopbrook Road commented that much of the work was a big improvement, but had concerns about a number of items that had been left unfinished. She asked Mr. Cole to come out to the site. Nevertheless, your predecessors approved Mr. Cole's request to release the escrow. The motion passed six to nothing. And so uh, this evening, or on the 20th, as you relinquish the last bit of leverage you have over a corporation, which I think we can all agree has shown itself to be somewhat less than cooperative over the years, I ask that you reflect on the moment 21 years ago when your predecessors knowingly relinquished the last means of enforcement over to Fino and so condemned us all to our current predicament. You all have the power to undo their error. I cannot imagine you would repeat it. We are counting you all, all on you to do the right thing tonight or on the 20th, as the case may be. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Rudy Cassidy. Hello there, Amherst Town Council. My name is Rudy Cassidy, and I'm actually a uh, citizen of Belchertown. I have lived there for the beginning part of my life, then I moved out to Boston, where I was a teacher at MIT Museum and a lot of schools in and around Boston. Three years ago, I came back here to Amherst. I taught at the high school. I hope to teach there again next year, but I am the face of one of those 24 cuts. What's happening, so I'm the AP Calculus teacher. I am a geometry teacher who just won the Teacher of Excellence Award the Pioneer Valley Teacher Excellence Award, and I'm one of your cuts. So when I look at the high school, it's not falling apart like the middle school is, but it has this thing at the end of it called the flex block, and the students are leaving every day for 40 minutes. It's 11% of their educational time. It's 20 days of school, and I've taught in a lot of schools. It is unacceptable. Students should not be losing that much educational time. And the reason why they are is because of the current schedule and the way that the school is being funded. Now, I've met the new coming superintendent, and she's amazing. So Dr. Herman, she can really turn the school around. And I want you to give her a budget that she can do that with. Now, they did tell me that I could move down to the middle school since my position was being cut. But I don't want to go to the middle school. I'm a calculus teacher, number one. I will find a community to serve. I've already been applying to other jobs. I don't want to leave. My hair is Amherst colors. My life is here in Amherst. I want to support this community, but I can only do it with your help. Please, at least the 6%. Thank you, Thank you for your comment. Lauren Mills. I'm Lauren Mills. I live in um, South Amherst, 12 Longmeadow Drive. This month is Bob Marley's death month, May 11th. I say this to say that may our lives reflect a higher purpose of good and bringing people together with our words and our actions, our jobs, careers, the manners that we pass on to our children and those in our schools, if we are a teacher and in our communities. Leaders of destruction have a pattern of destruction. You who sit in seats of power are incapable or unwilling to do things fairly, justly, or without prejudice. Those who have forgotten that people are people, 
You serve the people with your votes. You serve the people with your words and with your alignments. The students who have the energy and use their bodies and their voices to bring use to, to bring attention to the war in Gaza, thank you. And thank you for making a difference and a space for others to join a movement of peace and solidarity with Palestine people and make the connections between all occupied people around the world. The word occupied. Have, you, have we become occupied in the town of Amherst with everything except what really matters? Teachers, children, and students' futures, our health and that of the environment. Tear down this occupation and any occupation of madness, of injustice, and do it wholeheartedly, not with reluctance. We are grieving since 2020 more, more than ever. We are grieving and you in the town council for the most part leave, <laughs> have ignored those cries We've lost a loved, beloved member in the Amherst community, Sister Dr. Demetra Shabazz, who died looking out for and speaking up about the injustices in the town. Lauren. And let us not forget that. I have seven to, oh, sorry. We need what, to stop. Okay. Whether yeah. we are a high, high class, middle class, low income, we should all have something to contribute to lessen this thing we call injustice in the many forms it takes. As has been stated before Warren, the Amherst School. We really okay. need you to stop. Thank you. If you don't have now. us, we need to have us and we need to be there for our children and stay involved in what the town of Amherst is doing with the public funds for schools and education. Thank you, Lauren. I'm Rita Rutter. Hello, my name is Amrita Rutter and I'm a former resident of District 2, a senior at Amherst Regional High School and one of the co-hub leads of Amherst Sunrise. I'm here to speak in favor of a 6% budget increase for the schools. I've watched the school budget be cut every year that I've gone to Amherst Regional High School. And every year it has been destructive, but manageable. This year is different. $1.8 million cut from our school would devastate our school. I can see it in my teacher's eyes, I can hear it in the halls as friends talk of their families moving from the district if the budget passes. I can feel it in the building with us. Education is a public right. Without this school and the hard work of teachers like Mr. Buford and Ms. Peters, two of the people that will potentially be affected by these cuts, I truly don't know where I would be. It boggles my mind to see our schools as deprioritized as they are, under the library at the 4.5 increase, under the police at a 6% increase, under the 10 new vehicles we bought for this year for no reason. It boggles my mind that I can stare the $3.4 million billion dollar endowed institution in the eyes and have them tell me that they have no room for us in their operating budget. If the 4% budget passes, families will move out of the district. Enrollment will go down. Revenue will go down. If the 4% budget passes, my teachers, who have been fighting for as long as I can remember, will have to pick up the broken pieces of this school district and make it into something. I want to leave this district better than I found it. In lieu of that, I want to leave this district functional. I want to go off to college without worrying about my community. That will not happen if restorative justice is cut. That will not happen if we lose guidance counselors, prep academy, if we overburden the bright room. There are a hundred ways to fix this problem. Redistributing money from the library, from the police, from the around two million we found in vehicles already purchased last year, demanding money from Amherst College with a clear plan on how it will help the district. Please crowdfunding from the Amherst College alums. You only have to choose one. Please appropriate a 6% budget increase to of the schools. This is more than a budget cut. We need This is the end of a good school district. Thank you. Delaney Cheng. A point of order, I'm being asked to remind the audience to keep their signs out of the view of the camera so that the speakers can be seen. Thank you. Hi, I'm Delaney Cheng. I actually live in Hadley, but I attend the Amherst Regional High School. Currently, I'm in 10th grade and I'm here with Sunrise Amherst. Um, all I really have to say is please vote in favor for the 
um, budget increase for the schools. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Julian Hines. Good evening, thank you. Um, my name is Julian Hines. I live at 41 Pine Grove in District 5 in Amherst, and I am one of the co-hub leads at Sunrise Amherst. Um, and I just am here to ask that you not only approve the 6% increase, but I'd like to make it extremely clear that we've been asked as if it's a false dichotomy to choose between a 4% increase for the schools with the proposed 24 positions being cut and instead having to either cut town services to cut um, to take from ARPA or, uh, sort of grant funded revenues um, and then to uh, increase taxation beyond the 2.5%. Um, I recognize we just had an override, so that sounds pretty daunting. Um, that being said, I think it's important that we recognize that we have an increase in the library project that is at this point unsustainable to the town. Um, and that amount of money will also result in the town not taking out loans, not paying interest, et cetera, if we abandon or scale back this project. Um, and that will allow us to have money that we could reappropriate to the schools. We've also identified um, around $2 million in capital errors that we could use to reappropriate to reappropriate for the schools for an additional 2%, which I believe would fund up to five years in total. Um, and then in addition to those things, we also have uh, many capital line items that we could push back a few years um, or reduce the capital budget by about one to 2% um, and provide more continual funding for the schools as um, Leverett and and Shootsbury have already agreed to, and Pelham looks in that favor as well. So thank you very much for hearing from us tonight um, and for hopefully adjusting the budget. Thanks for joining us. Allegra Clark. Um, my name is Allegra Clark. I am a resident of District 2. I am also the co-chair of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. And though I'm not speaking on their behalf tonight, I did want to let the council know something that I heard in our meeting in April, which was concerning. And what it boils down to is that the, the schools are already in a staffing crisis. The superintendent called the director of DEI asking for CRESS responders to act as lunch monitors because of the understaffing in the schools. This was the reason she was given for the request. So we are already in a staffing crisis in the schools. So cutting 12% of the staff is going to be disastrous. Um, and I know there are people on this council that would rather not see CRESS be functioning at all. And I think that CRESS has made a great impact in areas in the community, and I'd like to see them do what they were intended to do, which is act as a public safety agency that's unarmed and an alternative to the police. Um, in terms of the budget for the regional schools, I would love to see the 6% that Leverett and Shootsbury have already agreed to. Again, I think our students are here and they're speaking out and they have done some really important work auditing the budget themselves. And they have found $2 million that is appropriated for something that it doesn't need to be appropriated for. That's why we need to fund our schools. Our students are smart, they are taking initiative and they are invested in seeing that their peers have the same opportunities that they do. This budget, with a 4% isn't gonna give our future students that same opportunity. So please do not approve 4% for the schools. Please look at ways to find 6%, maybe those $2 million that are left over. Thank you. Next is Rachel Hall. Hi, my name is Rachel Hall. I'm a member of the Amherst community and I have two kids. 
in the Fort River Elementary School. Um, I'm here in support of the 6% increase, um, not because I'm an expert or um, well-spoken or articulate in this field. Um, I have a background in systems of oppression, funny enough. Um, what I do know is that you always seek the advice of those closest to the system being impacted, which would be our teachers, our students and children and our families. And they've spoken very clear that this 6% increase is needed to keep us at base level, um, to keep not folks underwater, to keep not folks mentally at risk. Um, I'm confused because we moved here from out of state because the schools were raved about and that everyone said we invested in our students, that Amherst schools were renowned in investing in student success. Um, I think it's very clear what we have to do. I understand you're all in a really tricky position and you have to find money and move things around. And yet I don't think our police department needs more funding. I don't think the books on the shelves and libraries and buildings need more funding. If our kids are not safe and secure, none of that is of use to us. So I'm really hoping that you fund this budget like the other local towns have and that we can have a successful school system. Thank you for your time and energy. Thank you for joining us. James Master Alexis. James Master Alexis, 35 Linden Ridge Road, Amherst. Good evening, honorable members of the town council. I'll be brief. Uh, I am a, a group leader of 50 plus homeowners who that live in Amherst Hills, and I'm here tonight uh, in support of accepting the roads of the Amherst Hills as public ways. Uh, I know you've moved that question off to the 20th, and that's okay. I understand um, that whatever you're waiting for, you need to wait for some information on the 20th, and that's perfectly fine. I understand how this works sometimes. Um, I'll be back on the 20th, but I wanted to say, you know, in the last four years that I've been involved in this issue, there have been some questions in a, about our neighborhood, but all those questions have been answered, I believe. And the only question that I think is will be before you is, are our roads in proper form and built to town specifications to be accepted as public way? I think the answer to that is yes, I'm not the town engineer, but from what I've told, the town engineer believes that they are. I want to thank a few people, and I will be very brief. I know you have a lot of people that you need to listen to. I'd like to thank the planning board that voted, that has voted every single time on our behalf and in support of our neighborhood, and most recently, unanimously. I'd also like to thank Ms. Brestrup, who I see up there on the Zoom, uh, for talking to me every time that I thought I needed to talk to her and to be a very professional woman and to help our neighborhood. I want to thank Mr. Bockelman, who also was very transparent and responsive to us. Um, and um, I wanted to say that I'll see you all on the 20th. And thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Rich McLean. Hello, I'm Rich McLean. I live on Alpine Drive. Eight years ago, my family moved to Amherst. At the time, we did not work in Amherst, but we moved to Amherst specifically because we knew it was a community that prioritized education. I want to see Amherst continue to be that community. And so I urge that you work to find the way to make the 6% increase in the education budget work. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Margaret Sawyer. Hello, my name is Margaret Sawyer. I uh, live on Station Road. It's nice to see you all in person. Um, and I came tonight because I grew up in a town that has a slogan that they use. Um, a town is known by the schools that they keep. And to me, that's that's where I wanna keep living. I wanna keep living in a town that's known by the schools that they keep. Um, I worked this past year as a student teacher at Crocker Farm. My kids are at Fort River, um, my, my daughter is. And those have been, I've seen amazing things in the elementary school, elementary schools. 
my son started at the middle school this year and it has not been easy. We all know that it has been a lot of heartbreak for the staff there. It has been a hard, hard time for many years. Um, when I talk to specialists at the middle school, they, different people tell me how hard it is, what a hard year they're having, how hard things are. Um, and that makes me really sad. And then I also serve on the site council um, for the middle school, the site site council, site committee. And um, we talk about how the building's roof was caving in recently and how hard it's gonna be to make these cuts. I have friends who work in the Amherst High School who already know that their job is on the line. Things have already changed. There's already fear in the schools. There's already people planning to look for other jobs. Whether you pass this or not, there's already people making different plans because it looks like Amherst is not a school, not a town that's known by the schools that it keeps. It, the staff and students there, I don't think feel that level of support. So I thank the town for listening. I thank you for hearing from these students. I hope you will more. And I also thank the school committee and Shootsbury and Pelham, Leverett, excuse me, for stepping up. And I hope that we do too. Thank you. Caridad Martinez. Good evening, my name is Caridad. I'm just gonna get straight to the point. We have very little time. Um, I'm definitely hoping that you will reconsider and that you will absolutely approve a 6% um, increase. The 6% increase isn't even enough, really, but at this moment, this is exactly what we need to kind of stay afloat. I'm a substitute teacher. I've also been a member of the Equity Task Force. I was the co-writer of the proposal for the Restorative Justice Program. And um, what I would like to say is I, I've never, I'll be honest, be impressed at all by the town of Amherst commitment to schools. Um, I understand that the commitment really is to the rich and to the wealthy in this town. It is not a commitment to the poor working class, whether they are white, black, or brown. The commitment is to maintain wealth where it's at and not a commitment to redistribute wealth to support the people who actually need it. Our students need resources. Our students need not only what they have now, they need more. This town must make a commitment, right, to increase the budget and to give these schools what they need. And the people who know what they need are the teachers, the students, and the families, right? And so I hope, I, when I hear these stories about, you know, and, and I, I don't want to not acknowledge people's stories about I came here because of this, but the truth is that for decades, the BIPOC community has never received what it's needed, right? The town of Amherst has failed black indigenous people of color and poor working class white people for decades, I would say for hundreds of years from the moment that we colonized this place and the indigenous people were slaughtered and moved out and pushed out. So what I would like to see is a change, not from the past. I wanna see a change that mirrors the necessities of the 21st century, that we give these young people the tools and the resources to be able to fully envision a changed world. And we're not going to do it by cutting. We need you to wrap up. Yep. We're not going to do it by cutting resources. We're going to do it by changing our values and by living with the moral imperative that we must do for our young people what was not done for us. Thank you. Thank you. Amy uh, Coleman. Excuse me. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Amy Kalman. My pronouns are she, her. I'm right um, speaking as a resident and also an employee of the district. I'm a parent of um, two students who, one alum who's gone through. I'm also an alum of Amherst College. Um, I work with students who are not always represented here. So the regional school district budget cuts impact all students and are particularly damaging to students who are non-traditional neurodiverse learners, English language learners, student who, students who struggle academically, students from families with limited financial resources and students with disabilities. They are disproportionately impacted and their voices are underrepresented in this forum. The lack of transparency about the cuts impacting students served by the special education department, the English language learning department, 
Prep Academy, a tier two non-special ed intervention for students who struggle, and special education gen ed co-taught classes such as science at the high school is extremely concerning. Counseling services and restorative justice programming are also vital for these students' social emotional support and development. Robust elective offerings are also what keeps many students engaged in learning and keep coming to school. It has been a challenging year in special education at ARHS and ARMS. Leaves, resignations, changes in roles, disruptions in relationships between students and adults. One of the proposed budgets, this lower one, rejected by the school committee is for close to a 2.0 high school cut in special educators. Teachers, not paras, such as academic skills teachers and liaisons who directly teach, provide special education services and case management legally required for students with a disability on an IEP. I come from a family of educators from Concord, New Hampshire, where Krista McCollum, a social studies teacher at my high school commented, I touch the future, I teach. Truly, the most profound impact our tax dollars Please. can have is to invest in our youth. They are the future. Please fund an adequate school budget. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last name on the register. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Um, we are going to move on to the consent agenda. Let me again mention that items are on the consent agenda, but that does not mean they won't be discussed later on. The only thing that's on the consent agenda in this case are two referrals to the finance committee. The items were selected because they were considered to be routine. If you would like to remove an item, please say so after I make the initial motion. To move the file following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 8B, referral of FY25 budget to the Finance Committee. 8C, referral of proposed council order FY25-11, an order approving the acceptance of optional tax exemptions for FY2025 to the Finance Committee. Is there anybody who would like anything removed? Is there a second? Shane seconds. Thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead and start the vote. I'm going to start with Anna Devlin Gothier. I appreciate. I mean, I and I have a question. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that the items in our packet were updated um, pretty close to the meeting, and so for folks who had referenced those items, it might be helpful just to note that they should review the packet again for updated, corrected versions of those documents that are being referred. Thank you. Yep, and I'm an I. Uh, Councillor Ette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. It's unanimous. There are no resolutions or presentations tonight. Um, the, I will mention that under the town manager's report, he will give us an update on the Jones Library to the extent that we have that update. We're going to move on to action items. The first one is the acceptance of the public way for Amherst Hills. As mentioned earlier, we're actually not going to vote tonight because we don't have the approved motion based on all the documents. However, we are going to go ahead with the presentation and an opportunity for counselors to ask questions. So with that, I'm going to call on um, any number of people. <laughs> I believe Chris Brestrup is one of them and Guilford Mooring is the other, okay? Chris, would you like to give us a summary on the planning board report? It can be very brief. Uh, yes, uh, the planning board um, has been working on this um, project issue um, since 2013. They've worked with uh, Tofino Associates and the residents of Amherst Hills 
Um, Amherst Hills was um, <clears throat> not completed in the time that it was expected to be completed. I can go into detail about that if you'd like, but in any event, the planning board has been working on this for quite a while. Um, at their meeting on, when was it? Um, February 5th, um, they uh, voted, excuse me, not February 5th. They're at their meeting on February 21st, they voted to um, recommend to town council that the town accept the roads that are listed on the, um, I think it's on Jason's memo. <clears throat> Do you want me to read those those roads? Jason's memo says Hawthorne Road, Concord Way, Linden Ridge Road, and a portion of, uh, well, a portion of Linden Ridge Road. So if you'd like me to go into more detail, I can. Okay. Uh, this has come before the council before, so it's not, um, although it actually, had, there are some new members here that it were not at that council meeting when this was referred to the planning board. Um, Guilford, do you have things you would like to comment on at this time? I'd just like to say that this road has been through several iterations of review. Um, as, as people in Amherst know, a, a road, when you repair it or when you pave it, it does not stay perfect forever. Over the course of this project and accepting these roads, there has been deterioration in these roads and the developer has repaired it and it meets all of our concerns at this point. So we are ready to accept it and uh, we believe it meets the standards of the town's uh, system. Okay. I'd like to just step back and recognize that there are four counselors on the council that were not on the council that referred this to the planning board. This is a public way. And in order, it, this is a petition to accept this as a public way. At this point, it's a private way. And when we accept it as a public way, that means we take over the maintenance of it. It means we take over plowing it. We uh, basically, it is one of, it becomes one of our roads, the town's roads. And so uh, this has gone through a process of, um, as people have mentioned, it's gone through a process of review. It's also gone through a significant process legally as well as uh, repair. So as you, but please, as you are members of the council and you would like to have more description or discussion, please ask questions because this is not the last time a public way will come before us for acceptance. Okay. Uh, Pat. Thank you. Um, I'm concerned uh, not about Amherst Hills per se. Um, it does seem that Torfino has done the repair work that has been required, but I am very concerned about um, information and questions and requests we had back in February. Um, I think it was February 5th. And um, so I have some questions uh, that I need to have answered before I can support um, anything. And what basic question is at that time, uh, Ted Parker agreed that there were sureties for the Amherst uh, Hills project that would not, you know, that weren't going to probably be used and that they would then, that money would be given or kept by the town with Torfino's approval on to use for the Amherst Meadows issues, road issues. Uh, I want to know if that's happened and what's the amount of the sureties. Um, I also, we had a request in February uh, for reports from the town engineer on the status of the Amherst Meadows punch list the bounds and meet, meets of the road as it's constructed, a report on current conditions and any items that needed addressing, the need, you know, questions of the need for resurfacing and recommendations for acceptance of the road as public ways. And I, I am delighted that Amherst Hills is going forward, please know that. But I am directly uh, concerned by the continuation of issues at Amherst Meadows that have not been addressed. So can I get some kind of responses? Thank you, Paul. 
So you're not being asked to act on Amherst Hills tonight. So that, that is scheduled for the 20th, as is the Meadows uh, request as well. So, and I think the council had a list of about six or eight things that we we need to report back to you, and we'll do that on the 20th, which uh, includes, I'm sorry, which includes the, those items that you just ticked off. Including the sureties that they, that sure. Parker yeah. said. So, that yeah, um, we'll talk about what that, what that looks like at this point in time. In other words, he's not doing it. Uh, I don't want to comment on, on that at this point, but um, there it wasn't that wasn't the answer actually. Um, it's more of how it would be done. So <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> In fact, um, I believe we all received. I know I received a request from um, the Meadows Association that they be on the agenda, and we have we are putting them on the agenda for. The twentieth, yeah. at which point we will be expecting then an update on all of those items. Okay, are there other questions about this, Pam Rooney? Thank you. I would ask if if we're being given packets of information that we also get the drawings. There were no drawings in this in in the packet for tonight, and I would hope to see those for the twentieth. Thank you. Yeah. We can go back and get the drawings from previous memos and make sure those memos are in the packet for the 20th. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to end the conversation on this and move on to our next agenda item. Um, and we will see uh, the people for Amherst Hills and also the Lynn. Meadows on the 20th. I'm sorry, Kathy, yeah, you have your... I'm just asking, so we'd be voting on this on the 20th? We will. Okay, thank you. The vote, the, one, of the, one of the reasons the vote got held up is there's a lot of pieces of paperwork and the vote has to be done precisely and reviewed by legal in order to make it acceptable. And all of that did not happen in time. But we didn't want to postpone the presentation again. Thank you. And, and just, we don't have to go through a whole presentation, but we have to have all the documents. Great. We'll have all the documents and we will pull things from previous agendas so that all the documents, including a schematic, are there. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Chris, you had your hand up? Yeah. I just wanted to note that I think the February 5th meeting of the town council, the packet for that meeting would contain a lot more documents. Right. So I'll go back and look at that and maybe the counselors would like to look at that too. Well, and we'll pull that into the packet for the 20th. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Are there any other questions or requests with regard to this issue and the meeting on the 20th? Okay. Then we're going to go on to the main event for the evening. I hate to say that for anybody else that's interested, but we do have a budget. It's been presented by the town manager on, as required on May 1st. It was sent to us with links and we are going to have a presentation on that budget. During the um, consent agenda, we have already also done what we're supposed to do, which is refer this budget to the finance committee, which now begins putting in a lot of work. Um, so, um, Athena, are you going to sit up here with them? No. Okay. Well, first of all, we'd like to welcome, um, as always, our town manager, but also our former finance director and now consultant, Sandy Puller, our co-interim finance director, Jennifer LaFontaine, and Comptroller Holly Drake. And I do want to recognize the role that Athena has played in the preparation of this budget. Okay. So... Floor is yours. So I'm going to kick off over here. Um, right. So the first slide. Well, so this is sub submitting your on on May first. We, as required by Section 5.4B of the Town Charter, uh, I submitted the uh, FY25 budget to the Town Council. And um, so we do have a lot of thank yous. Uh, not a lot, actually. You mentioned the people, who, the team that was really responsible for pulling everything together. And um, really appreciated Sandy Buller coming out of retirement to help us through this process. It really calmed the waters in many ways and helped us um, bring this major, major 
multiple hundred page document uh, to conclusion. Um, it also the budget also includes budgets for the elementary schools, the regional school district, and the library, along with the capital improvement program. And just a shout out to Sunrise Amherst for noting, you know, doing such a careful read of that so quickly. Uh, you know, that was helpful to us, and we've updated the budget to reflect the things, the discrepancies that they find found in the document. So, um, it, and I, the, one of the speakers earlier on talked about the. Um, you know, the qualities and capacities of our students and that really, it really showed. So thank you to them. And um, I thank them out in the hallway as well. Next slide. So as I said, oh, is that it? Oh yeah. So as I said, you know, this is, there are five elements to the budget, town, library, elementary schools, regional school district, capital improvement program. And then there's two other things that form the actual um, financial basis of the town, which is a community development block grant and the CPA. You've already, those are things either that you've looked at or don't come to you. Um, and, you know, we're really proud of this document. It's um, built basically on prior year documents. And, you know, we, we, we work from that as our, as sort of our basis point. Next slide. So this is going to be a challenging year for us. Um, the regional school district um, has asked more than the budget coordinating committee and the town projected we could afford. The other parts of the budget, the elementary schools, library, town budgets, all were able to develop their budgets within the 4%. When we look at that number, we say you have 4% elementary schools or town, figure out how to bring your budget to the um, to the council within that 4%. Within that 4%, you there you will see different places that are, that are higher than normal, higher than the 4%, some are lower than 4%, but it really is the overall budget that I'm responsible for delivering to you, that's 4%. Um, we have, um, in order for us to maintain this budget, it's going to require a sustained, um, and to talk about the, the regional school district, just to talk about, because that's that's really the issue before you, it seems like. Um, it's going to be require a, a really a serious sustained conversation with the school committee, the finance committee, members of the town council, and our other partners in the, in the region, the other towns. Um, my job in presenting the budget is to maintain the town's finances and maintain our strong financial position as a town. And that means that we have a balanced budget that's funded by recurring revenue and that we can go to our bonding agents, which we're going to do Wednesday, I think it is, and ask them to look at our bond rating. And, and having a balanced budget with recurring sources of revenue is an important piece of that. Um, and why do we say 4%? We initially said 3%, if you recall, back at the um, financial indicators back in December. That was based on our revenue projections. All of our budgets begin with our revenues. What is coming into the town? And from that, we say, here's what we can afford to buy in terms of services. Um, additional information came in in January after Sandy got on and, you know, he got deeper into the numbers and we found there's enough um, savings in one area that's one time savings actually that allowed us to go to 4% and we presented that to the budget coordinating group um, in February and that seemed, everyone seemed to be pretty pleased with that. Next slide. So the key points, this is... Um, it's, I want to make sure that you understand that my job in our our town has to have a balanced budget by law. So we have to be able to approve a budget. The council has to approve a budget that is balanced. Uh, the, it includes 10.5% for capital. It doesn't include an override. Um, we're going to touch on some of these things later on. But it does fund our outstanding liabilities. Liabilities are the debt that we've already taken on that and the payments we have to make. Uh, OPEB, which is other... Um, post-employment benefits, which is basically health insurance and pension. These are liabilities that we have taken on. We, we, and we have to continue to make progress on filling those li those, those liabilities. Um, we have um, maintained our reserves because it's really important for a community like ours to make sure that we have enough money and for that, what they call the rainy day fund. And that we have to look at this over multiple years. It's not a one year outlook. And I think that's where the conversation has to focus on as we start talk about the regional school district. This year is one thing. What about year two, year three, year four, um, as we go forward? I'm going to turn it over to Sandy now. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, good evening, uh, council members and those of you listening at home. Um, I'm going to just walk through numbers, which is one of my favorite things to do in the world. So um, I hope you join me on this trip. Uh, the budget summary, uh, as the town manager outlined, there are four major groups to the budget, the town budget, the schools budgets, which are the elementary schools, the regional schools, and the libraries. And going back many years, uh, there's been a pattern in Amherst where each of these goes uh, up at the same pattern. Originally, it was going up at 3% uh, back in the fall, and then we were able to find some savings and uh, better numbers on state aid. So we did that to 4%. And I just want to reiterate that on the municipal side, that means the combination of all elements of the municipal budget. Within that budget, some departments are going up uh, more than 4%, some are going up less than 4%, some are even going down. All those things can depend on any number of things, uh, including whether people have retired or have got steps or um, other things that are just kind of intrinsic to the peculiarities of that department in any one year. What I can tell you is that we have not added positions in this budget with one exception, which I'll talk about in a minute. So when you see changes in a particular department's budget going up more than 4%, it's not because uh, we're adding more people there or um, other things. It's because um, that it just the happenstance of that budget in this particular year and the staffing uh, it's the people who drive this budget and um, paying for them is what drives the increases from year to year. That makes up $96 million of the budget. Um, there's still about uh, another 20 uh, some odd from other sources, including what we spend on capital, what we spend uh, to pay for retirement and OPEB as the manager mentioned, and the assessments that we get from the state. It is in these uh, last two areas that we saw significant uh, savings from what we originally projected. Retirement, we think, usually goes up 6% a year. In th this year, it went up barely 1%. So the money that would have gone to pay that uh, retirement assessment for our Hampshire County could instead go and fund that 4% up above. Similarly, on assessments, uh, the state gives us money and the state takes money away. And this year, they're taking away less money than they had in the past. And that's mostly because uh, our PVTA assessment went down and our assessment uh, for charter school tuition went down. Uh, so because of all that, if you put that all together in the shaker and jiggle it up, it means we have a 3.6% increase in our overall spending this year, which is very typical of what Amherst budget increases are from year to year. On, on a typical year, Amherst overall goes up between about three and three and a half, maybe 3.6%, really not much more than that and really not much less than that. It's a consistent thing year in and year out. I will say as I go along here, if there are questions that you have, I'd be more than happy to answer them, but otherwise I'm just gonna keep talking. All right, so we, we're gonna about to spend $97 million on, out of our general fund. Uh, that includes 4% for each of those four major areas. As the town manager noted, the regional school committee voted a budget of a 6% increase instead of 4%. That would cost an additional $355,440. Um, that's just the amount of money we're talking about, the difference between a 4% and a 6% budget. We continue to spend 10.5% uh, of the tax of our overall budget on, um, on capital, uh, particularly of the tax levy. Amherst has always been very good at spending money on capital and um, there are some towns that don't do a good job on spending money on capital and then they fall apart and then they end up spending a lot more money to try to fix things down the road. Um, so we've maintained a commitment to capital. I will speak a little more about the details of that and some of the reporting that's been reported on social media today uh, in a minute. 
Uh, we continue to meet our other long-term obligations, health insurance and pensions, um, and overall our increased spending is 3.6%. Um, I just wanna highlight some of the spending uh, increases. Uh, these appear both in the operating budget and uh, in the capital budget. Uh, we're spending $1.3 million on roads and sidewalks, including money we get from the state under so-called Chapter 90. We've just started this year under the capital budget uh, funding municipal roof replacements. We have a lot of old buildings in town and um, roofs, as uh, Guilford was saying earlier, roads fall apart eventually, well, so do roofs. And uh, so we are starting to invest in those so that we can maintain the security of our, our buildings. Um, we are uh, spending $200,000 for technology equipment. Um, we've added $100,000 for stormwater management um, and $40,000 for more trees. Um, on the climate area, I think trees is a nice segue into this. Uh, <clears throat> the town has broken ground on a new net zero elementary school, as you all know. Um, we have uh, created in this budget for the first time an independent sustainability department. It had been in um, community development and now it's its own department. Uh, in capital, we've started uh, a multi-year project to invest $250,000 in energy efficient and sustainability. Um, we are about to roll out residential heat pump incentive program and the town has adopted a specialized building code to further reduce greenhouse gases. So uh, we continue on the green path here in Amherst. Community health and safety, a lot of change. We're seeing a lot of change in names and faces at the heads of our, our police, fire, dispatch, and press departments. Um, some of, so <laughs> you can see them in these pictures. Some have been replaced already. Some are in the process. Um, but I'd say this is a very significant uh, amount of turnover. It just ha happens to be timing um, for these key departments that help provide public safety across a, a broad array of methods uh, and um, programs. Um, the council adopted a residential re rental property bylaw. And um, because of that, we did add a couple of positions uh, to the inspections department uh, so that uh, we can have people to do the inspections of residential properties. So that is the only um, increase in staffing. It is paid for by new fees that the council voted for, but also while doing that still remains within the 4% of the overall town budget increase. Um, Racial equity and social justice issues. Um, we will, uh, this year will bring about further uh, development of the residential oversight board. We have maintained funding uh, for uh, the DEI uh, department, an important department, which uh, does a lot of good work. And I think Amherst is really a leader across the state in doing that work. I've worked with a lot of other towns across the state and I think Amherst does a great job here. Um, we've continued, uh, we've put a little bit more money into uh, child care reimbursement programs for elected officials, which would allow a broad range of people to run for office and be able to access uh, these meetings uh, without having financial impacts. Um, and uh, we would continue with community visioning sessions on racial equity and justice issues for the entire Amherst community. Again, continuing a uh, multi-year commitment to these. Affordable housing, um, there are a lot of particular projects. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the details of each one, but you can see um, both the CPA is uh, funding projects. Uh, there are street projects on Felchertown Road, uh, Ball Lane, Northampton Road, um, and the town, as you know, purchased the former uh, VFW uh, right down the street here and is working to convert that into housing. Uh, enterprise funds um, are sort of boring this year. There's not a lot going on in them. Um, they are continuing to provide uh, the services that you expect, uh, the biggest sort of water and sewer. Um, and uh, we've built uh, monies in there to continue capital upgrades and maintain those in, in good shape. 
uh, but otherwise they are um, pretty much just continuation of things you've seen in previous years. Capital. Um, so I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about capital. And the first thing I would like to do is offer an apology uh, because um, I made a mistake in putting out the capital budget in not in the numbers, but in the words. Uh, the numbers which were reviewed by uh, the JCPC are all correct. Uh, the, they reflect the numbers that I've shown so far, uh, reflect the numbers that are on here, and they reflect the numbers that I'm about to show you. After JCPC did its excellent work on the capital project, um, it turned the document over to me to then add a bunch of uh, written descriptions of each of the individual projects. And I started on that, but I didn't finish it. And then I turned it over without thinking to be published. So all the vehicles in the capital project that were published on the town's website are from last year. None of the vehicles that were approved uh, for this year made it into that document. So then some people looked at that and correctly said, hey, wait a minute, we're spending the same money twice, except it was just a mistake, and it was my mistake, and I apologize to the council, to my fellow workers, uh, to the manager, and to the entire town. Uh, I just dropped the ball and didn't, um, didn't update those properly. They have since been updated. They are on the website now. And so, um, as I say, the numbers are correct. Just the description of what we're buying uh, is incorrect or was incorrect. It has now been corrected. Um, so I just want to put one finer point on that. That means there is no $2 million of things that are just lying around because we already bought them. We're buying new things this year. We continue to invest in capital. Um, and um, so again, if you have questions about that, I'd be glad to answer. Uh, but that is, was entirely my fault. Um, so our capital improvement program does continue to spend 10.5% of the levy on capital. Um, it uh, incorporates improvements to our buildings, to our roads, infrastructure, um, and um, with a strong look at sustainability and, and climate impact. Um, you will see on the written description of the projects, uh, those that are in green are particularly um, suitable for climate sustainability uh, and they're, well, they're green projects. Uh, I'm just gonna show you the uh, numbers here. And unfortunately, because uh, on the screen, whenever I talk, this little box shows up and shows my words and therefore blocks out the very bottom numbers on this screen. What it says, however, is that uh, this year uh, we're spending about eight point seven eight point eight million dollars uh, total on capital with the general fund and um, CPA. Uh, that is a balanced capital budget between the resources that we have up above and what we're spending below, including cash capital and debt. Uh, in the next year, we have about a uh, five hundred thousand dollar deficit. The next year after that, about a hundred thousand dollar deficit. FY28, there's a surplus of, I don't remember how much, but and then in 29, a $50,000 surplus. So overall, uh, we're in good shape for actually the money we're spending for FY25 asking you to appropriate. Over the next five years, we'll continue to need to look at uh, the proposals that people have put forward. Um, we're in range of being in balance, but uh, frankly, um, we're just a little bit out of balance. That, this is not the first year that, that that's happened. We're not always in balance every time for the out years. I think that's okay, as long as we're in balance for the current year. Uh, the list of projects that we have, uh, there are a lot of little tiny letters up on the screen. Uh, I know you and people at home probably can't read this, but these are all the projects by department uh, and the ones for FY25 are in the highlighted uh, kind of beige column there. And it goes on for three pages. Um, you can see the things that are in FY25. Then if uh, for some things, 
if there are proposals for projects in future years, they're in the white columns uh, to the right of that. We break things down on this by showing whether we're spending cash capital or whether we're gonna borrow uh, for these projects. And then if we say we're gonna borrow for them, we uh, then do a projection of what we think those borrowing costs are out into the future so that uh, we understand overall what the impact of spending cash or borrowing is. In some cases in the capital plan, there are instances of um, other sources. State aid is one thing, uh, the ambulance fund pays for ambulances and so forth. Uh, but mostly Amherst capital plan is one that uh, uses cash capital and some borrowing. Uh, all right. Uh, I like this picture because it has some great looking people in there digging dirt. Uh, and uh, I think we're all very excited about the new Fort River Elementary School. Um, so in terms of ongoing capital, uh, uh, we're very excited for that. We're about to sell the town's bonds for those. Uh, that would be the first tranche of money uh, that comes in. And then as we get other reimbursements from MSBA and so forth, uh, we'll spend that money. Um, here's another thing with even smaller levers, but to me, this is, um, this is the kind of thing that I think about and I hope that you think about all the time. This looks at our five-year outlook for, uh, the town's resources. It shows, uh, on this first slide, all the revenues that we are expecting for the coming year a 3.6% increase, and then in the following years, uh, how much uh, total revenue we have and what the dollar impact of those is. And I would just say um, that in each of the forward years, the percentage increase of revenue is going to be, uh, in this instance, somewhere between about three and a quarter and three and three quarters percent. That is the kind of town Amherst is. If you were Cambridge, you might have four or five percent because that's the kind of community they are. They have a lot of businesses, they have a lot of growth. Um, when I worked in Arlington, we were probably about a four percent community. But Arlington really is, but excuse me, Amherst really is a, um, you know, three to three and a half percent community. That's who you are unless um, there's outside sources of uh, revenue or unless you do things like have overruns. You're basically stuck being a three to three and a half percent community. Um, what that means right now with the outlook we have and this forecast is that next year, FY26, so as we in the budget office already start thinking about FY26, even as we're putting FY25 together, we're starting out with about a half a million dollar deficit. And that goes up to about $850,000 deficit by FY29. This assumes that spending is gonna go up for those four major areas by only two and a half percent, which is a little lower than we've seen here in the past. So this is the forecast as I inherited it. And um, it already starts with some deficits I think it is likely that those deficits will be reduced uh, over the next few months as we continue to look at um, whatever state aid we're gonna get, and particularly as we look at new growth in town. We tend to be very conservative in estimating what new growth is. We estimated it $650,000 a year. In the last few years, it's come in closer to 900 or a million dollars. So there's some growth that will do a good job of wiping out some of those deficits. So that's the good news. The more difficult news is that there are other pressures on the budget in the coming years. I mentioned that this year, a retirement assessment went up less than 1%. It usually goes up 6%. There are some weird reasons it went up so little this year, mostly having to do with who was on staff on September 30th uh, of the of 2023 
So what staff positions we had filled and what vacancies we had. And we just happened at that date to have more vacancies than we might have in other years. So the retirement board thought, oh, you don't have as many people, you know, your, your costs aren't gonna go up. Um, that's not likely to recur next year. So there's gonna be some bounce back. Is it gonna be the usual 6% or is it gonna be something like 10%? I don't know. I do know it's gonna be a lot bigger than the zero or the 0.1% that we had this year. So that's one thing to look out for. The second thing I would just mention uh, is that we're assuming only a 2.5% growth for the town, the regional schools, the elementary schools and the library. Uh, that may be what Amherst has to do, but those aren't big increases. And um, if you start to look at a 3% or a 4% increase for those budgets, those numbers get a lot bigger. They get into the millions. Um, I have talked with the finance committee, with uh, the town manager, with uh, chair of the council, and with some of you individually about the need to have some of those conversations about what the future looks like. Uh, I have always said, if you give me the money, Amherst residents, I'm happy to spend. But we're in a situation where they're giving us three to three and a half percent increases every year, and that's the world in which we have to live, unless we do something else about that. So uh, I just point this out for now. This is how things look into the future. Um, and I think uh, the town is scheduled to and needs to have a lot more serious discussions about what this looks like with some what ifs as we go forward. Um, yeah, I'm gonna take this. Thank you, Sandy. Um, such a cheery ending there. Um, so, but it's important because that's the framework that we're working in, in terms of when we look at the budget, we can't look at FY25 only, we have to look at out years. And as Sandy said, if we start to project higher increases uh, without additional recurring sources of revenue to support those increases, we have a major deficit um, and it's gonna really impact our operations within a year or two. So it's, it's very serious. Um, when we look at this, um, there's a lot of the, the town has the town has always been very ambitious on what we wanted to do. There's a lots of challenges in bringing everything in, um, and we will address them all in one way or another. But we do need to prioritize. The biggest priority right now is about the fiscal st 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 stability or sustainability plan for the regional school district. That's that's front and center in our conversation. We've heard a lot tonight about the the needs for the district, but we've also heard tonight about the limits on our revenues. So that conversation has to have ha has to happen with our our school district, with our um, with our union reps, with the the other towns, with the council. Um, and so you know we need to move into a place where that conversation, a very serious conversation can can go forward. Um, the other piece that I know that is very is a high priority for the for the council are roads and sidewalks. Um, and then also the major capital projects. They're a little bit in in, uh, in disarray right now. We are we know we have the school moving forward. We know we have to make progress on the fire and PW. And there's, there's lots of questions around the Jones Library where that stands. So one of our goals before Sandy leaves is to help us revisit um, that entire um, major um, project uh, spreadsheet so you can start to review those. Next slide. Um, so one of the things I talked about was leadership changes that we talked about. And I, you know, I was thinking about this and there's a lot of leadership changes going on right now. You know, we, you, you proved the, the police chief, um, our fire chief, Tim Nelson is retiring. And so we'll have a new fire chief. We brought in a new director of community, community responders. Our dispatch director is, is retiring. So we'll have a new dispatch director. Our finance director, we're seeking to fill that position. We, the school committee, great, fortunately, was able to hire a new superintendent of schools. Uh, they're looking for a middle school principal. And then as we, as, we, as we expand out, there's also, there's a new president at Amherst College and a new chancellor at the university. So much so that the president of Hampshire College is now the dean of all of the five colleges. He's only been here like five or six years. So, um, you know, and he's relatively new still. 
And then just to, as a side note, the directors of the chamber and the bid have taken other jobs as well. So there's a lot of transition happening and that's not to be, you know, there's always transition. The only thing that's, that's, that's certain is change, but with these high level positions, superintendent, you know, um, finance director, these types of positions, that's, it's, it's trying for an organization to maintain our ability. And I just want to, again, credit, um, Holly and Jen and, you know, for, and Athena and Sandy for coming in to support what was a really arduous process of putting this, this, this document together for you. Um, you know, it shows the strength of uh, leadership we have. One of the challenges, you know, when I got here, people said, well, what's, what's, what's most important? What, what do you notice about the town? And I knew before I got here that the town had really top shelf um, department heads because I'd known them. They were statewide. They were known statewide. But I didn't understand is that we have, we had really strong seconds in command. You know, if you look at DPW, police, fire, um, finance, across the board, we had really good people ready to step up. What's happening, though, is a lot of folks don't want to step up. They're like, I like my job. I want to keep doing my job. I don't want to take on what that next job looks like. And I think that that's, that's becoming a, more and more of a challenge for our organization as we start to um, try to fill these major vacancies. Um, Amherst has very high standards for its department heads, and we really work hard to get excellent people, and we're usually pretty successful at it. Um, but I think it's not just the town of Amherst. It's also it's statewide. We've talked about it even today um, about the challenges of recruiting and retaining people um, in the new environment um, for our town. So I just wanted to really sort of focus on that because I think that that's sort of a, a narrative that I've been really thinking about a lot as we move forward through our budget process. And... And that's, I think that's the next slide. I think that's it. Yeah. So that's it. I mean, I want to say, you know, we've got some good stuff happening here. You know, we have solar on the landfill. We have a new school coming. The, the North Amherst Library, for those of you who are there, is just so gorgeous. Um, you know, the, the North Common is taking shape. You know, we have new parks at Groff Park and Kendrick Park. There's a lot for us to be proud of. And I think we should sort of take a minute and think back like what we have accomplished because it's so easy for us to be in the weeds of the challenges of the moment. And we always overcome those challenges, but we, we often don't stand our, lift our heads up and look back at what we've accomplished. So as a community, there's a lot that we should be proud of that we're moving forward on. So we're here to answer questions, but, I, but be aware that, you know, we are well aware that this budget will be torn apart by the finance committee over the course of the next month. There will be a public hearing on it um, at um, May 21st, and then there'll be a public forum on the capital budget on June 4th or 3rd, something like that. Third. Uh, and then, um, and then it come, the budget will come back with a finance committee recommendation in June, and then you'll have a month to look at it and, again, paw it and decide where we want to go. So thank you for your time. So let me begin by just saying thank you. This is... <laughs> whenever ever I look at our budget document, I go, yow. This is not just a small document. This is, you know, the equivalent of a dissertation. Um, and in this case, fortunately, being able to be done by a committee. So we really want to thank all of you for everything that you did and for our department heads who have worked so hard to come in and beg for money. Uh, I had to do that for the town council, by the way. Uh, and, you know, sometimes they get what they want and sometimes they don't. Most often they don't. But we want to thank you for putting the full picture together and recognize that it is no small feat. And um, as a team, you've done a great job. So with that, I'm going to start calling counselors. Andy. Yes. Um, I'll just repeat quickly the same thing that you just said, but I don't have to go into as much detail as you did. Thank you for all of you who put the budget together and have been managing finance department and it's been a very difficult year. Uh, it's been really impressive how we've continued to go forward. I did have one question, Sandy, and that is on the five-year projection, uh, I was curious whether there were any places where you didn't mention that might bring some additional revenue. Um, and the one that I thought about in particular was on, under local receipts. 
and whether you had given any consideration to what uh, the governor has proposed in the Municipal Empowerment Act and some of the options that might be available to the town if the legislature follows through on that and uh, whether that would uh, make even a small difference. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have looked at that within uh, the Municipal Empowerment Act 2. Uh, they have um, proposals to allow uh, municipalities to increase their motor vehicle excise tax by 5% to increase their uh, meals tax, I think by go going from point, no, the hotel tax from 0.75% to 1% and the meals tax another 1%. All those together, if the legislature enacts those and uh, Amherst adopts them, would bring in about another slightly over $200,000. That's the scope of what's being discussed at the State House now. Pam Rooney. Thank you. I really appreciate that, that presentation. Um, I think we understand that discussions about the Jones Library will be occurring. They've already they've already started to be talked about. And I I just want to ask that the finance committee um, and looking at the, the finance director and Paul Bachelman, are we going to see or are we going to be able to project if there are any changes in our capital budget or any of these numbers whether the project goes forward or whether the project doesn't, will we be able to reflect those changes in this coming budget? So on the Jones Library, right now where we are is we have a bid, a single bid for the project. Um, we have to either accept or reject that bid by June 10th. So the answer is prior to when you adopt this budget, you will know uh, whether the status of that project of the Jones Library project, um, and if not, you know we'll we'll be able to quantify what that looks like in the budget totally, in terms of the impact where where it li lives in the budget. You'll be able to see what those numbers are. Okay, AMD. so we would we, we would see the ramifications one way or the other. In other words, yes, good. Yes. George. Yeah. Um, one takeaway I get from this uh, presentation, and again, thank you all for what you've done, is that um, a conversation or conversations will need to take place um, over the next uh, couple of weeks, I take it, within the next month at least, uh, involving the major uh, players. Um, and so I'm wondering if we can uh, get some sense of who, when, and where um, these conversations take place. I assume it's something beyond what would normally take place at the FinCom discussions. And um, I'm not envisioning them taking place during a council meeting. So I'm just asking uh, what, where, when, and who. Can you just clarify, George, do you mean about the budget or do you mean sp about specific issues? Well, yeah, I, I, what came across to me very clearly is the issue is, is, is a many year issue um, and involves thinking about uh, a longer range set of questions. Um, and I took away from what the comments that Paul made is that there needs to be some serious talking um, amongst parties, um, including this, the regional school committee, the union, the council, um, and uh, with the financial facts in front of us. Um, and that's what I'm asking about is, is when, when will that take place? How will it take place? Um, that's my question. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. It's something we've, you know, I've talked about, and um, we had actually talked about this last year, quite honestly, when Sean was here about a fiscal stability group that was mostly staff driven. I think it's beyond that at this point. I think we really do need the elected leaders to come in into a room and start to have some of those sort of pointed conversations. Um, and, and with the other communities, um, I don't have a really clear concept of what that looks like exactly, but we're really focused on developing what that, how that conversation can be had with adequate sort of um, support in terms of getting the numbers and things like that. So, and I'm really focused on the regional school district because they're the ones who have come in at, at a higher percent than the other entities. Okay. Um, Kathy. 
I have two questions. Um, and since I'm on the finance committee, I'll get to ask them again tomorrow, but I thought I'd ask them tonight. And I have some minor ones. On the regional school budget, um, I realize we don't have a formal proposal yet for the 6% I, that the school committee voted on. So when we are sitting together talking about the budget in the finance committee, will you be able to show us some potential ways we could get to 6%? That's my first question. Um, you know, we, um, I can think of a few. So just how we would do it and whether that's one, a one time versus going on the base. My second is a follow up on Pam Rooney on Jones. Um, the one of the big expenditures, if you go back to the capital budget, is the Jones building starting to come online. What is not in the estimates, um, and Sandy gave us a fairly good reason why, is we only looked at the 15.7 million. We didn't look at those short-term band notes because it wasn't clear when they would come on. So the news that the, it's even higher gap than before is troubling because that current capital budget doesn't have that those interest costs in it. I mean, it has a small amount, it has 50,000 a year, but it doesn't have the big amount. So the sooner we can get Jones information, the better, because it will it will reflect what do we have for roads, what might we have for other purposes. And I guess I, I do have one more, but I think it's gonna be on the agenda um, separately. The regional school track will have to re, be rethinking, but my understanding is it might come in at a place that we could reconsider some of the money we voted before. So if we, I don't know when that conversation is scheduled, Lynn. Um, so it just all feeds into thinking about what's available for the operating budget next year. Thank you. Mandy Jo, go ahead. I also get to ask finance committee, but a couple in preparation for tomorrow's capital improvement. Um, I sent some in before we knew some stuff and as always questions come up. Um, and the first one's about the library again, Kathy just talked on some of it and touched on some of it, but the FY25 capital spending has a borrowing payment for the library of about 1.2 million in within that capital spending. So um, at some point, I think finance is gonna need to know what the plan is if the project doesn't go forward or if it goes forward with um, a different project that requires 16 million in borrowing or so um, when that would happen um, and what the FY25 modifications may or may not be for that um, spending on in terms of just financial orders and stuff like that. Um, and then I also have questions on the regional budget, but the process. Um, Two years ago, I think it was, was the first time a school committee had come to the council with a budget that was above what the manager proposed. And I thought we went through and received some sort of legal opinion as to what the process was, if the council wanted to do that, like what we needed from the region. I haven't been able to find that legal opinion. Um, I looked, I don't know where I put it in all my documents, but I, I I vaguely remember a legal opinion, but maybe my memory is wrong. I'd like to know the process, like what is under the MGL statute, it says on recommendation of the school committee or recommendation of a regional school committee, what does that mean? Just them passing a budget or do they need to come to us with a formal letter request or something before we can even consider an increase above what the manager's budget is and just things like that. What what are the processes for all of that? If we could get that in finance as we talk about and get to talking about our options, knowing all of that would be very helpful. Um, since we're on that issue, because both Kathy and, and um, uh, Councillor Haneke have mentioned questioning the process i've also would like as we enter into that discussion to have some sense of where we might find that money that's what i was trying to ask yeah. on it um i might not have been clear but no, it, i mean i had 
yeah. you know, I pointed to one place that if the track comes in between CPA and our special appropriation, less than that, there might be money there. But 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 uh, whatever whatever the town manager can come to the table would would be great. I I just want to point out that borrowing money that we have to borrow is not real money. So saving money from by not borrowing doesn't find money. We have to actually find money. <laughs> um, so other, because I don't think we'll borrow for this. Um, that, um, um, the other thing I want to also um, mention is that we have discussed because of the forecast that um, Mr. Puller has done, um, Puller has done, uh, that we probably would have a BCG meeting sometime in the next month or so, because it's really important that people in all of our different parts of government start getting a handle on what this fiscal picture looks like. Uh, Jennifer? Uh, yes, thank you. So um, just echoing what others have said and a uh, number of the public comments, I mean, recognizing that we have to also look to the shortfall we're facing in the years ahead, I, I do hope we can find the resources to um, meet the requests from the school committee for the budget at 6% and, you know, can find the $355,000. Um, and it's terrific that we were able, you know, to look at what we, the increase of only 1% rather than 6% for, for the retirement um, expense. But what I'm also wondering is, because I know we're often told, well, we can't really move things between departments, but in both Cress and the police department over this past year, there were a number of unfilled positions. So I'm wondering if money was saved there. And just as we were able to move some funds from the retirement to the regional school budget, if we might be able to look at where we didn't spend all the money that was appropriated in different programs and departments. So every year, large departments have a certain number of vacancies, fire, police, DPW, typically. What happens when there's a, a vacancy, particularly in public safety, is you still need bodies in those positions to be in the cruisers or the fire engines. And so what you have to tend to do is then bring somebody in on overtime. So a, a vac so and there's, there's always sort of this balance between how many funded positions do you want to have, how many vacancies can you have at any one time? And and over the years, we've tried to get that right and have the right balance. Um, if there is money turned back at the end of the year, um, it ends up as free cash. So it doesn't disappear. It goes back to the town's coffers. Uh, the town, as most well-run towns do, fully funds all positions, assuming that they'll be filled throughout the year. Um, and then if, again, there are vacancies and you have to bring somebody in on overtime, you have enough money to do that. Um, so I would say overall, I don't see that there's an opportunity for those big departments to move money out of those departments, even if they've had vacancies, because they do tend to, to use them up. Oh, so not on. Um, again, completely, as Sandy was saying, completely different fiscal year. So any savings that we have in this fiscal year, we would not be able to use until free cash is certified sometime in the fall. And then it would be an appropriation that could be used to fill gaps. But it's not going to help us right now with the FY25 budget until 24 is over. We know what we have left over and it's certified by the DOR before we can use that. So I, I suspect there will be free cash. I don't have a projection on that, but it's not going to help us until sometime in fall. I hope we can look in other places. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. But just to put that in context, every fall that we come back to the council and we talk about free cash and what money has come in, and then we provide you with some options for how to do that, whether you want to put more money into roads or what all the all the priorities that you've already listed. That's because we see it as one-time money. And I do want to note for the schools, you know, we can't just look at this as a one-time solution. If, if that were it, it would be an easy answer. 
they have a structural deficit because half of you know a big chunk of their budget is funded by ESSER money, which goes away next year. That's one of the causes for their deficit is that they've been funding their budget with one-time money, which when that money goes away, you suddenly have a major um, deficit. And so that also has to be accounted for next year, just like, you know, so I think that as we look at it, we have to look at a multi-year strategy to say they're going to be in the whole beginning on day one, $500,000 less revenue than they had this year before they do anything. Um, so I think how they have to do more planning about how they're going to manage that. Mm -hmm. Pat DeAngelis. Thank you. I, I want to clarify uh, in terms of the regional school budget, the difference between the 4% and the 6% is 355,000 something. Um, and that feels to me like a num an amount that can be gathered. But, but particularly, I'm concerned right now about Amherst College. I, from what I understand, and my information may not be accurate, so I, I, that Amherst College made a proposal of about uh, $10 million over 10 years or a million dollars a year uh, given to the town for specific projects, and I don't know exactly what they are. Why, what, why can't this shortfall or this difference, it's not a shortfall yet, this difference be um, requested from Amherst College um, and put in a multi-year, if there is really money coming from the college every year, and education is one of the things they care about, why can't that be used uh, annually to support this, given that ESSER funds and, and stuff are going away? And I, um, for, it's, I, I will say, I will answer this, and then Paul, will, the manager, will have to answer some of it, too. Um, and I will just up front say, I don't know anything about Amherst money. I mean, so it may exist, it may not. I, I just have no knowledge about it. Um, what I would say is what we have been focusing on, uh, I think, with the regional budget are two things. One, spending ongoing money. So as you said, if there's some source out there, Hallelujah. But on the other hand, uh, it has to be a recurring source of money. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is, um, I think the school department, given that it has declining enrollment, needs to explain why its budget is going up more than the town's average annual increase in revenue. Um, they have not answered that question that I've heard. And so I think as we think about how to fund their needs, we need to think about what their needs really can be within a town like Amherst. Paul, did you want to? Sure. So, so UMass does give a two hundred thousand dollar donation to the schools every year, and they, you know, they they spend that. Uh, Amherst College they have been giving about eighty five thousand dollars a year to the to the district, um, and they allocate that. The schools get that money, and they decide how they want to spend it. Um, so, so if there was additional money that the, the college or anybody was going to give directly to the schools, that was a recurring source of revenue, that would be something that would be good for them to, to for us to identify and move forward on. But I also say want to note that we're not it's we're not in isolation. If you look around, to, you know, South Hadley has their town meeting coming up. Um, there's an article. There's a. a, a a piece on New England public media that talked about how this is happening in many other towns. Northampton is a classic example. Um, they're they're like a year ahead of us where they used a lot of one-time money last year to plug a hole and now it's it's a bigger hole. And we're all talking, we're all in the same sort of percentage uh, changes and there's a lot going, there's a lot of moving pieces. So it's not, I'm not saying the school district has an easy answer or we have an easy answer. If we had a lot of money, that'd be an easy answer, but we don't. Um, but in terms, it's, it's the contractual relationships that we have with our, our employees and, you know, employees, their, their, their pay isn't keeping up with inflation. So you want to be able to compensate them uh, appropriately, but that sort of digs into our two and a half percent revenue that we get from the, the people every year. So it's a, it's a, it's kind of a zero sum game and it, it gets really, it, it gets, it gets eaten up very quickly because our insurances are going up much higher than they have in the past, both health insurance and property and liability. 
So those are things that we can't go without. So we have to sort of take care of those fixed costs first, you know, our debt services and things like that before. And then we say, well, how much money do we have to actually operate our business here? What about the rainy day fund? So, so again, we, um, isn't there at least 355,000 there? Sure. But again, it's, it, it's a principle of the thing of, of using one time money yeah. that, yeah. Uh, you, that you don't have next year. It's like spending out of your savings account in essence. I mean, that's a rough way to think about it as opposed to having it coming in on your paycheck every every year. So it's like, and at some point that goes away and you can't, it, and, it, it's, and it's in, been the, in the town's financial policies and the guidance not to rely on one-time money to support the ongoing budget. Thank you. Pam? Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the people that are on the finance committee who have been asking questions because many of us don't get to hear those being asked at the finance meetings. Certainly many people in the public don't get to hear them. So ask away. I think it's good for everybody to hear them. Um, I had a question about the, the creation of a separate sustainability department. What are the financial re uh, ramifications of creating a separate department? Because I know we created DEI um, and CREST. What 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 does sustainability do? Um, we created a new department on paper, but we didn't give them any more money. We took some of the money from the conservation department that had been there for sustainability and moved it over to sustainability. Um, so we did it on the cheap. The, the point of that, I think, is since sustainability is one of the major goals for the council, we wanted to have more transparency in our budget. Otherwise, it was sort of in the conservation and development budget. This way, you see exactly how much is going into sustainability. So there, it is also to promote tra transparency. Okay. Andy? Well, I had a couple of things. Um, one on the schools, and I'm saying this partly from our fellow counselors who haven't been involved in it because I think the staff has ex been experiencing this and observing it for a long time and for the public. But the school question is not new as long as I can remember. And it's been a lot of years that I've been involved in budgeting from the old finance committee meeting through select board days and council days. Every year, the school does the budgeting in the same technique that they start with what will it cost to maintain level services and then they determine what revenue they get. There's always a gap and then they make um, adjustments, some adjustments end up being on some programs and we see little bits of programs go each and um, so when we talk about the regional school reality, their costs are rising, as Andy indicated, at a, at a greater rate than um, either municipal resources or uh, other uh, departments, other sections of the school. It seems to be particularly uh, in the regional school. And um, I think that it's uh, sort of as, as indicated, it's, got, it, it's worse this year, partly because we knew that they were using one time ESSER funds for um, operations. And that was, we predicted that, that was going to catch up. And we said, you know, please be prepared. Please tell us what you're going to do. And uh, let's uh, say we as uh, the finance committee. And uh, we we did not get a response to that. And then we're in the position that we're in. Now um, we're going to have to make uh, some difficult choices of what to do for next year's budget. Um, you know, you know. You know, I don't personally desire a crisis, but uh, you know, it is uh, upon us to try to figure out what's going forward. And it is a four-town process, 
and uh, the complexity of the law around that, how that four town process is a little bit more than I think we want to get into tonight. So this is a tough, tough issue. And um, I was um, pleased that talking about trying to create some kind of a group that can really look at the issue both on the revenue side and the expenditure side because uh, I think that we have reached a crisis point which is evident now. The other thing that I just wanted to mention, I sent this to the town manager this question previously. When we did the lot projections um, back in 2020, um, with is what was the town's commitment and how did the town's commitment to those library preservation uh, okay. compare to what it would cost just to do the repairs to the current library. And uh, one of the things that the trustees uh, did was they hired Kuhn Riddle to look at options to um, address the repair issues if we did not do uh, the renovation project and just did repair of current facilities. And there were two um, options that they came, came up with. One was, um, and they were both multi-year, multi-part projects, one totaled $16.8 million, and one was 14.4, which was one of the reasons that the council at that time said that 15.8 million was a reasonable number, considering that we have to spend that up there. Uh, so one of the questions that came to my mind as soon as I heard what happened with the bid um, was that it would be um, helpful to at least see if there's somebody who can take a look at the Coon Riddle work and see how uh, those numbers bear now, because we have to assume that those numbers, the 14.4 uh, and 16.8, were the two options that Coon Riddle defined at the time have also increased. And that we get as part of our report, some understanding of what that is. So, um, I just w wanted to share with the rest of the council and the public that I have raised that question and I'm hoping that we can at some point get an answer to that as part of the whole presentation. So thank you. So Paul, I wanna go back to the fact that at the uh, four towns meeting and subsequently in your budget message, um, and tonight you've mentioned, and I, I at the Four Towns meeting said, this is a problem we all need to work on together so that it's not us versus them. It's us working with the schools in a way that clearly demonstrates our valuing education, which we do in our community. Um, so I really, um, it's disheartening, unfortunately, that you were able to start such a thing when we still had Sean and our former superintendent and uh, it fell apart. So I wanna make sure it doesn't fall apart this time. It, we don't have a choice. We have to all sit down together and say, what do we want education to look like in Amherst and how are we gonna make it happen? And so I um, speak only for myself, but I am more than ready to start working on how we're going to make that happen, what that committee needs to look like, how that process is going to happen. Because we can't be sitting here, given what we saw at the um, regional um, four towns meeting, uh, what next year looks like. I, I mean, it next year is, uh, it's out of control. There, it, it isn't, it isn't a $355,000 solution it's a much bigger and much tougher solution. And we can't be sitting here next year saying, gee, I wish we had formed that committee. So 
um, whatever it takes. We need to do it, do it fast, and it needs to be clear what that charge will be. Um, Kathy? I'll just echo what you just said, Lynn, but I, I think it's an intense effort to be rethinking curriculum, rethinking a lot with, and I know we're bringing in a new superintendent and we're the council and we can't micromanage. I mean, we're not, right. because we don't have enough information to make those decisions either. I, I just wanted to um, supplement what Sandy said about sustainability of breaking it out. We do, along with the person who is in that department, we have a line in the capital budget called sustainability that's real. It's another, it's a quarter of a million dollars. And one of the things that's enabled us to do is plan to seek grants. So we sometimes have a matching grant to get more money. I'd like to have the town over time, not write this budget cycle, be thinking of how that could work even more so. I mean, with, with the one person, if we get the grant money, they've got to figure out how to implement it, but we really need to be talking about both. And there is quite a bit of money on the table now between the state and the federal government to support some projects um, that are around electrifying and are around solar. So, so I know our one person is involved in all of them, but just trying to make sure that we don't drive a terrific person out because she is trying to do multiple things all the time. So I, I think it's terrific what we've done. And I just, uh, I'm just gonna, because Andy raised it, I'm going to be sending off my thoughts on the Coon Riddle and also how not all that money needs to be town money. There was an elevator in there that did not need to be in the list. And we were told that verbally, and it was a million dollars of that cost. So it's real money. So just when we come back, if we switch to a plan B, we better have a real plan B on you know the roof, the HVAC system, and let's get it moving. And Paul, I know you can't move on a dime that way. You have to have an engineer or someone come in and tell us what it's going to cost, but being able to think, because we don't want the building to fall apart. So as, as we move that way, but we're pretty, we're a few weeks away from having to think about that, but not very far. So the, I just wanted to not let Andy's comment sit like it's the same amount of money. It's not necessarily the same amount of money. Um. Are there any other questions or comments on the budget? We have one other item that's fiscal. I'd like to do it so that we, um, people may need a break, but at the same time, I don't want to hold our staff any longer than they need to be. Um, the other item, in fact, is the, we've already voted to refer. It's the proposed council order FY2511 and order approving the acceptance of optional tax exemptions for FY2025. And I believe, um, is Kim with us even? No. Okay. Um, sorry. If there are questions about the optional tax exemption, we can take those up at Finance Committee. She's available at that time. Thank you. So uh, with that, I'm going to again thank you all uh, for getting us yes. started. Yes, thank you very much. And, and, um, and I, I just want to say, Sandy, your apology was much appreciated. But when I opened it on Thursday, I should have called you right away and said, the word list doesn't match the number list. Yeah, thanks. We wish you had, but <laughs> um, I just wanted to say thank you from the bottom of my heart to Sandy Pooler, Jen LaFountain, and Athena O'Keefe for supporting me through a very difficult budget process for myself. So thank you very much. Thanks. Great. We are going to take a 10 minute break and then come back and finish the meeting. Please turn off your speakers and your cameras. I need to have some reasonable explanation. I opened up the Amazon <laughs> India at midnight last month. Oh, well, article was there. I just um, just thought about it. <laughs> Whatever it is, you did. Yeah, and I guess none of us have said that.
And then I emailed Paul at like 12. So they don't see it, but you still see it in the morning. Yeah. Um, but I needed this in I nation. I didn't even, I didn't even tell John to draft this. So I had no, I didn't touch it in the budget. I haven't gotten that piece, but where we ended all the other yeah. article. Right. There's no way this is. Right. Anyway, thank you. Sandy. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, may the fun begin. May the fun begin. <laughs> Jennifer, have we met before? I think we met at MMA, probably. Okay. All right. Um, because there's a, now that Jennifer but there is another in my Jennifer. life, I think, somewhere. Oh, is it the one in Northampton? I don't know. It's just, but your name was like, wait a minute. And then <laughs> I thought, like, from my youth or something, but maybe not. Where are you from? Uh, I grew up in Newton and lived in the Boston area most of my life. So, oh no, where'd you go to college? Dartmouth. No, that would. <laughs> but um, no, because I have to say, I you look really familiar to me sitting there. And oh. then it wasn't until you came up, I was like, oh, that's Sandy. So I don't know. What... <laughs> okay, okay, well, did we go to summer camp together? Yeah, yeah. maybe, maybe. <laughs> Anyway, nice yeah. to meet you. It was nice to meet you too, and thank you okay. for you really saved if the somebody, day. If somebody ever comes up to me and says, "I've had this happen," says your face is familiar with the names wrong. It's because, in fact, I have an alias. I, when I was previously married, I carried my husband's last name, and I went by Judy, which is my first name. Oh, that's right, because Lynn's your middle name. You're Judy. I was Judy. That name, and now I live in Greece. And literally, I had somebody come up to me in Washington one time and say, I know you, but the name's not there. <laughs> I cannot think of you as a Jew. I know. Did your I know. sisters call you that? No. Oh, you just came. No. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I dropped it when. When I moved to Rhode Island, right after I got yeah, that Wow, that, I did it. I dropped it then. Yeah, I never felt like a Judy. No, but I, I, totally never did, you. I never did it legally, so I always, legally, I write J. Lynn. Yeah, no, I have seen the J, yeah. and I've wondered. Yeah. It's my middle name's Lynn, so. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Now, have you ever met that yeah. one? <laughs> my sister in law did that, and it took me years to get it straight.
I mean, it'll stay on. As you, as you return, please turn your uh, video back on, but don't turn your sound on yet. Thank you. Councillor Ette, would you please turn your video on so I know you're back? Thank you. All right, moving right along. Uh, we have no appointments tonight, uh, and but we are going to go on to committee and liaison reports, although please remember you just gave one last week. So um, CRC, Pam Rooney and Jennifer Taub. Pam? Thank you. The only... Uh, um... Uh, reminder is to please reach out to ask people if they're interested in serving on the planning board and you've seen several iterations of the bulletin board notice so you should be well armed with um, with the material to share thank you thank you elementary school building committee kathy and councillor walker we have a meeting coming up on friday the 17th of may and at that point, we'll get the new cost estimates for the 90% drawings. And by the way, these drawings, um, this is a document that is starting to be look like the bid documents. You know, it's that level of detail. So it's it's pretty exciting, uh, the stage we're in. And that's the 17th? Did that's the 17th. And we meet at, I'm, it's a Friday. Let me just, 17th is a Friday. We meet at 8.30 in the morning. Okay. So we should... Um, we often don't get the document till just before the meeting in this place. I can't remember when the cost assessments are due back to them. They need to reconcile the two different pieces, but it will be at a minimum presented to us, but we usually get it about the day before, right, Alicia, on this with a, a summary and then this big, long cost estimating document. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Finance Committee, Bob Hegner. Yeah, as Lynn mentioned, uh, we're going to start uh, tomorrow with tomorrow's meeting. We're going to start reviewing the the budget, um, and uh, we'll be pretty much every Tuesday and Friday. We we will not we'll try not to meet on the twenty fourth, which is just before Memorial Day weekend. Uh, that's a Friday, uh, and we intend to do our final recommendation of at our meeting on Tuesday, June 4th. Uh, for those in the audience, uh, we plan to do this to review the school budgets on the 14th, uh, Tuesday at two o'clock p.m. And ju just I want to add to what Bob just said, if any of the counselors have questions um, on small or large, send them through to Bob and Athena so we can get them to 
the presenters when they come in. So it's elementary and regional that we'll be doing on that day. And that's Friday. That no, that's the fourteenth. Tuesday the fourteenth. Tuesday the fourteenth at right, two. Thank you. I should know this. I was at. This no, that's that. I just have it memorized because I took that part of the budget to do questions. But okay. but we merge all the questions that any counselor comes up with, so they they're looking at a consolidated list. Thank you. Um, Gol Anna. Gol has not met since the last time that I uh, have given a report. However, we have five resolutions and proclamations on our agenda for this week. So we will be busy. Thank you everyone for that. Um, and uh, we also will be working on our the timeline for the charter review committee um, and the finance committee appointments. Um, we've got a couple big things on the horizon too. So we're really trying to tackle that, including the town manager evaluation, the um, uh, legislative process guide, and um, as soon as we get it back, the um, legal recommendation regarding the um, successor committee charge to AHRA. So those are all coming to us um, or with us currently, and we're working our way through them as fast as we possibly can, uh, along with everything else that comes up. So thank you, everyone, for your patience with the process. Okay. Um, we're going to do the Jones Library building under the town manager's report, so I'm going to skip that. Um, and except I think Pam uh, to confirm you have a meeting tomorrow, right? Okay. Uh, town services and outreach, Andy. Yes, I don't really have uh, much to add to the report from last week. I just want to remind everyone that um, the 16th, which is our next meeting, we're going to be focusing largely on waste taller, though not exclusively. And then on the 30th, we're going to be um, trying to meet with staff from various departments to get a better picture about um, what the options are on things of um, speed limits, traffic calming, and other things that um, are, are, are that can be done by the town. And uh, I, for either of those, if you have any questions that you would like us to explore or pose during those conversations, um, welcome um, anything that you send along to me as uh, committee chair on those issues. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's no minutes to approve, although we do will have a catch up in two weeks, I hope. Uh, and so we're going to go on to the town manager's report. Paul submitted a written report of about 13 plus pages. And so, Paul, do you want to give us some highlights yeah, and just, then spend a little time on Jones? Sure. Just a handful of things. Uh, just to thank those who were able to come to the North Amherst Library ribbon cutting. Um, it was really a nice, nice, beautiful day. Great event. Great music. Uh, I I messed up because I forgot to talk about at the end to do the ribbon cutting. Um, so we had to ga gather people after the fact to get, get come, let's do that um, ribbon cutting. So, um, but it was a terrific day, you know, great people speaking, a big turnout. And thanks to uh, Angela Mills who put a ton of time into organizing that and to Dona for supporting it by providing the, the, the food and things like that. So, uh, and if you haven't been up there, please make an effort to go up there. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful building. Um, the second thing was the cleanup day, which happened a week ago, Saturday, um, which was, a, a, again, a, a gorgeous day. And we had a, a really good turnout and uh, three in, three rally points, Groff Park, Mill River, and Kendrick Park. And we had counselors at each one to help sort of guide and, and actually do the do picking up trash. And that was, a real, that was a terrific thing that we do every year. Lots of football players were out there you know, patrolling different roads and things like that. Um, Valley Bike, you you already you talked about that when I wasn't here, and you approved it, and that's you know we have the press release out on that, so that's moving forward. Um, electric electricity electricity aggregation has been approved by the Department of Public Utilities, um, so I've updated you in the town manager report on what's the next step for that. It will go back to the committee um, today. Um, I was invited to uh, be at a, with a very small group with the governor, lieutenant governor, and the secretary of housing and livable community communities. Um, they really are focused on housing and breaking down barriers to creating housing. And it was a closed door session. So the press wasn't there until afterwards. 
And they were really were saying like, what else can we do to create more housing? And we talked a lot. And from my perspective, uh, they had a number of managers and mayors from across the state, uh, probably maybe 10 or so of us that were there. Um, and uh, we're, so for us, we talked about the, the demands placed on our community based on uh, the student housing, the demands for student housing because of our little location of UMass and um, and and how it in, 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 um, infringes on the recruiting efforts of UMass Amherst and Hampshire colleges because we don't have a wide range of housing, not just affordable housing, but it's also market rate housing. So the administration feels like it's their number one job. It is an economic uh, deterrent in our in our state and that we're losing that 24 to 36 age group who are moving out of state because they can't find houses that they can afford to buy. Um, it's an all things, everything on the table. Um, the uh, Lieutenant Governor call also said, you know, we're looking at OPM. I said, what does that mean? Other people's money. So, you know, and we're looking for other people's money too. Uh, and so lots of effort based on affordable housing and just generating more housing for everybody. Uh, they talked about um, manufactured housing to bring down the cost and also um, ADUs, uh, accessory dwelling units. And and they've talked a lot about MBTA communities and the zoning that's required there. So they're in this battle and um, they're hoping, they, they feel like the time is right for them to make some significant changes in housing policy in the, in the Commonwealth. Lastly, the Jones Library. So uh, bids came in on... April 26th, Friday at 2 p.m. I should have said bid came in because it was one bid. The amount for the bid was 42,742,000. It's about almost about 18% above the, the cost estimates that we had. One bid is always a bad sign. Being 18% above what we estimated is a is a is a terrible sign. Um, so the owner's project manager our real OPM and uh, our architects are working with our capital projects manager and others to sort of sort through what was in the bid, what drove it up so much. Um, and so what are the options available? We're going to, we're going to talk about them tomorrow with the Jones library building committee. So what's, what, what's their assessment? What's their analysis of the bids? Do, can we go out to bid or not? Um, can, can we re rebid it? Are there ways that we can make changes to it? Uh, there's, you know, all these different variables are in play. Um, we have to make a decision by June 10th. So there is a bit of time, but not a lot to, and, and ultimately um, it's all gonna be driven by finances. You know, what are the paths forward? And um, so I don't have a lot more information than that, except that to say that, you know, the our consultants have been looking at this bid and talking to people who bid and people who didn't bid and say, why not? And trying to understand the market conditions under which this is happening. Um, so we'll, as much as they, they can share based on their private conversations, we'll, we'll talk about it at the Jones Library Building Committee meeting tomorrow. It's five o'clock, I believe. Is it? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, and then, you know, all those, all these decisions, you know, We've been steadfast, or the council has about its contribution, which is $15.8 million. Um, and if it's gonna be more money, where does that money come from? And if it's gonna be, you know, or else how do we change the project? Are we allowed to change the project under MBLC? So more questions than we have answers, um, but uh, just to let you know that we are working on it uh, through our consultants primarily and trying to figure out if this is a go or not. Um, it's an important time because if we say it's a go, then a lot of other things click into place. Um, we had a, a separate uh, a location, a temporary location for the library that uh, we had, they had asked us to sign a lease by last Tuesday. When this bid came in, I did not sign the lease. So we are, I did not want to commit the town to any additional expenses. So that's where we are at this moment in time. Um, and I don't know if I can answer questions, but I'm hoping that I can listen to them. Okay. Questions on anything in the town manager's report and or the Jones Library update? Bob Hagner. Yeah, the, the Paul it would be helpful to know whether the uh the difference in the bid, the, the one bid we received was due to labor costs or material costs. 
because labor costs, there's not much we can do about material costs. We might be able to do something about. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's a, we'll, we'll ask that question. Um, I mean, we have had some people look here, some ways you can save on material, you know, it, it means redesigning the building. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's sourcing your materials from somebody else. Um, and, um, you know, the, yeah, so those are, those are, those are the things that we have to look into. Mm -hmm. Yep. Kathy. Just building on Bob's question on the sources of it. Um, I'm also uh, wondering whether I watched and then I went online to look at it, the number of times the questions came up on the bid documents and the number of complete replacements of documents, whether the bidder built in a large premium for uncertainty, um, uncertainty either on uh, future change orders because we're not as we're asking them to be at risk for it without putting a risk premium into the bidding. So my, well, I'll stop there, but I do know the 1993 building, um, the, what I call the new addition is now the old new addition, uh, was there was a concern that we had cut back too much on some of what the architect had originally wanted in the building. And then we had a construction crew that didn't do everything right and they weren't fully insured. So I'm just wondering how much of a premium was added to hold on to the reputation of the one bid we got. Because we did get it from a good company, but they might have said, you know, there have been too many changes even while we're trying to figure out what to bid. So um, I know you can't control that, Paul, but there have been more than a number of them in the bidding process of changes. Um, Jennifer? Uh, yes, I, we have a lot of questions. I think I'll just start with, um, what, I am not clear what the council's involvement is going to be over the next few weeks. So if the, I'm not quite sure how it can be a go with such a, a large discrepancy between our budget and how, what it came in, but if the design that the building committee decides they're going to vastly redesign the building that that might you know be a way to work within the budget will the council like i'm i guess i'm not clear is if we have if the price increases the council has to vote on that but can we also weigh in on the design if it vastly changes yes yeah, so i think there's two levels at the council one is if you've appropriated a certain amount of money and we can't sign a contract beyond what you've already appropriated. So that's fixed. If, there, if there's going to be more money, a dollar more, that has to come back to the council. Um, in terms of whether we take a, a, you know, go back out to bid or do something else, there'll be a cost involved with that. And, you know, I'll be talking to you about where that money comes from and how we, how we finance that, if that's what it's going to take. So it's not a matter of the building committee or whoever, the town, negotiating with the one bidder to say you'd actually have to go back out to bid and yeah. so we would have a role in yeah okay yeah i mean the building committee will have a primary role in our path forward but we don't we don't issue the bid no. the town issues the bid right. yeah and you're the one that signs the contract correct but you would definitely have to come back to us if there was any request for additional money right but under what other circumstances would you come back to the council? Only if we needed an appropriation to do something else. And I don't really know I what see. that option is, but if we said we needed a half a million dollars to do something different, explore something that might require a different appropriation. Okay, uh, Jennifer, please go ahead. No, so if, if the building, I mean, it's already been value engineered. If there was continued value engineering so that it, was a very different building than what we've been seeing or even you know what the public was seeing when they went to vote in 2021 would we get to have an opportunity to weigh in on that it, i guess i really i don't want to speculate on that until we know what we're really talking about yeah yeah i mean first of all m mblc approved a certain size building that, to the best of our knowledge, can't be changed. Right. But 
materials it's built with. Yep, that would be part of it, what I don't think we know yet. Yeah. It's a big dollar amount. That's the challenge. I, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Councillor Haneke. So my questions are not on the library project. So if others have them, we can stay on that till they okay. come back to me. Um, uh, Councillor Ette. Likewise. Uh, Councillor Walker. Um, I just have a quick question about the temporary space because I think you said you didn't sign the lease for that. Um, and that essentially we have until June 10th to decide what to do with the current bid. But is there more time to decide what to do with the space? Or did we just pass up on that? And if we were to move forward, we need to find a new space. Um, it doesn't mean that that space goes away automatically. It's just not rented to us. So, But there's no guarantee like on june 10th for us to come back to that space or like do we have a timeline by which we think we would be reconsidering or are we more concerned about the bid itself we're concerned about the bid itself yeah okay councillor haneke go ahead so i have a couple of questions and comments um i mentioned this at crc uh community resources committee but the downtown design standards in your manager's report indicated that the stakeholder meetings were going to happen or were started to happen and have already started to happen. Mm -hmm. Will CRC be involved in those stakeholder meetings? Because I personally believe they should be since that push came from this council to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, the War Memorial, there was a listening session tonight at 7 p.m. on War Memorial Park. Yep. When will the council be able to weigh in on ideas and plans for that since it was, will there be another listening session? Will there be other opportunities since it was held concurrent to a council meeting? Yeah. None of us could go if we wanted to. So please let us know how we are able to weigh in on that. Um, and with that, how does the regional school committee's likely decision not to rotate the track affect the plan for War Memorial or even the fields to begin with on that whole project that already had a plan that required track rotation. And then finally, I was disturbed to see a couple weeks ago that the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee needed to file, a town committee needed to file a formal public records request with the town to get documents and information from the town that logically falls potentially under their own charge. Could you explain why they had to resort to filing a public records request to get information on dispatch calls from Cress? Because that's what was reported in the paper that they needed to file a formal public records request. And that doesn't seem right. It actually seems very wrong that a town committee that's set to oversee Cress mm -hmm. would have to file a public records request against their own town to get documentation related to Cress. Yeah, I don't know the answer to why they did if they chose to do that without asking the staff person first or not. I just don't know the answer to it, but I can look into that why. Councilor Ette? So I have two questions. Um, on page four, there's a brief comment that speaks about you receiving the legal opinion on reparations. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know what happens after you get it. And then the second question is from page six, where you speak about the opioid settlement. And let me see if I could get this. So you, or at least in the report, it's mentioned that you are opting to first collect residents' ideas for the funds. And I wanted to know if you could expand on that. Mm -hmm. uh, on HRA, HRA legal, that'll go to all the town councilors, but I think it's going to live in uh, GOL. That's where it's going to wind up for discussion and finance and finance. Um, and this is, I think this is going to be an opinion about how, um, where funds can come from and how you can handle funds. It's really a financing 
question. Um, on the opioid, that is um, the advice from, this is a major settlement and we get a certain amount of money every year. And it's, it's, it's supposed to be spent on um, addressing the needs of the harm done by people who've been um, addicted to drugs or opi opioids. And the way you're supposed to process this is to listen to the people who've been most impacted by this. So in our area, there's a lot of little towns that get a little bit of money. And then, you know, Northampton gets a sizable amount. We get a pretty decent amount as well. And so our health director has been working with a, a group, um, I forget the name, maybe it's Hampshire Hope, I forget exactly who it is, uh, to do more of a regional approach to, so that these, we, we can sort of land, because these things, to, a lot of times addiction doesn't observe town boundaries. And so looking at regional solutions, and that's why they're looking at it as a regional approach. It's still, the funds still come to the town of Amherst and to each individual town. And as I noted that our funds have been segregated separately into a different account so we can account for it there. And because this was something new, the DOR had to make some additional rulings on how towns could, because it was falling into free cash every year. So ours is, 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 is set aside in a account that you can actually see, and then it gets appropriated out of there. Um, so if I get you correctly, then it is that one, it's in a separate account, but two, because you're working on a regional basis. Once that is done, then there might be a proper way to make use of those funds. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And our health director can talk much more eloquently about this. She knows she's been really working on it. So if you'd like her to come in sometime or, or talk to you individually, that's fine. Um, so I have two non-library questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is, did I read the report correctly that we have already retained somebody, some organization, some company to demolish the VFW? I think they went out to bid um, and hired someone to demolish that building, yeah. Okay. All right. It's, and they've it, done, I know they did an asbestos assessment of it and all those things that needed to happen. I'm sure the asbestos is all over the place. Right. Um, okay. And then second... Am I correct that we have not gone out to bid for the construction of the new elementary school? All we have done so far is the site work. Mm -hmm. That is correct. That's what I think Kathy talked about earlier. Yeah. Okay. So we will get another estimate on the 17th. And then when will we be going out to bid for the construction of the new school? Plan is to be ready in July. So the paper the the it it this is a quick turnaround that the bid documents will be all pulled together so i don't know that we have an exact date yet paul i have a date written down but i don't have it with me yeah i'm just remembering beginning of july yeah. you know and then that the, we do have that in a sheet on a timeline so i can get that back to everybody but it's a pretty quick turnaround which is why this this ninety percent is nearing to be a hundred percent in terms of mm -hmm. which window goes where and how thick is it and what's the color of the design around it. I mean, it's 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 they're starting to be they are bid specs. Yeah. Okay. I, I I'm asking that question frankly because I don't think people realized that even though that we're working on the site that we still don't have the bid for the school. There's a lot of people who think, well, we're no, often no. That's that's correct. And so, it, for others who are listening, we um, because the site need to be reworked in terms of the footing that the building will be on. There was an early site package. So what's happening is dirt is being taken away and dirt is being brought in, and then there are it was there something called aggregate piers, which we were described as, think of a pin cushion, putting a lot of pins in it. And when you put the pins in it, the pin cushion gets really hard. <laughs> so that becomes a footing for the eventual building that goes on it. But that needed to happen several months before the construction started to allow the whole thing to settle. So the, the design team, I thought was brilliant to figure out, just break that out of the other projects so we could go out early on that. So they're they're more ready to go. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. I again point made. We we do not have a final price for the school. Okay. Alicia. 
Um, I have uh, some questions regarding the resident oversight board. Um, it says that we have gotten, we're moving like to the second phase. We've done a second set of um, requests for RFPs, but I'm just wondering what was the outcome from the first phase? Like, do we have something tangible that came out of the first phase that's being used for the second phase? Yes, yes. there is a report that was that's, that will be the basis for what the second set does. Okay, and is there somewhere that like that's accessible? I can find out where that is, sure. Okay, that would be awesome. And then for the second phase, they'll be using that first phase to, we're moving to implementation? Okay. Yes. Um, and then my next questions were about the Youth Empowerment Fund. Um, I mean, I mean, youth empowerment. It just says that ARPA funds have been set aside to support yep. this work um, and that there will be additional outreach and assessment of possible sites. Um, I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit more on the plan for that. I think the last time I had an update, we had an AmeriCorps yeah. person who was working on that, and I didn't ever hear any updates as to like what findings or anything was the outcome there. Um, but I know that we were looking at like feasibility. And so if we're moving to assessing sites, maybe we had some type of determination. It, that person didn't work out as well as had been hoped. Uh, um, and so I think what we're looking at doing now is to have two things. One is to look at th buildings that we own or that might be available that could serve in that function. Also to have somebody else, an actual contractor come in and or consultant who to really do the um, needs assessment that didn't really get done well with it with this you know um, our core our our volunteer or whatever their name was yeah do we have like a timeline for that I don't have one but I can get one for you but it's a good question to ask Jennifer a uh, quick question <clears throat> um, in response to I appreciate the long write up on the senior center but we also got in email today so um, from a resident. So I just wanted to ask if there was any update on the elevator at the senior center. So there were elevator repair. There's a whole story about elevators and how hard they are to get them fixed. And it's a statewide issue. There are very few elevator companies. They set their own schedule. Getting them under contract has been a challenge. They don't bid on projects. So um, if you have an elevator in, a, in the library, they won't submit bids. They'll just it's it's a really um, tight community or of businesses and they just it's tough um, there was there were people I know last week um, who were there working on it I don't know the status of it. I haven't had a chance to follow up with that question but okay I'll get an update for you yeah. Kathy um, I just looked up the schedule July 5th is when the bid documents will be out and bids due back on August 7th. Thank you. You know, the other thing that we've done and all, I don't know the exact schedule, there were a couple, uh, the circuit system and the emergency generator turned out to be on a long back order. So to get ahead of that, we're, we're breaking them out of the package and doing early bidding on them. Um, so, so it was like an 18 month delay, but it, it won't delay the school because of the way they've done it. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting way they've tried to anticipate delays and and avoid them. It's not just interesting, it's impressive, frankly. <laughs> it's good people. Pat DeAngelis. Uh, something else that's impressive is on page two of the town manager's report. <laughs> and it is about the uh, graduation the receiving of a master's in public administration from Suffolk University with a 4.0 average of our incredible town clerk, Athena O'Keefe. And I so identify being the first person in my family to have gone through college and also gotten a master's. Kudos, love, everything. Can Thank you believe you it? Isn't that great? <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's nice to have her back. <laughs> <laughs> between between the, between the budget and the yeah. inclusion of the degree, um, I think Athena would like to suggest she doesn't want to repeat April and May over again. But congratulations. And the budget, right? She's done phenomenal. Um, 
Are there any other questions? Oh, I actually, I want to ask another one. I'm going to build on uh, the question that uh, Alicia asked about the Youth Empowerment Center. I, I guess I didn't know we were looking for a location. I thought we were looking for what the program would be. We, we, we're doing both. Okay. And at some point, I assume you'll bring back to the council what that's going to look like, what's it going to cost, or whether we have a partner that's going to be doing it or yeah, any I, number of things. Because yeah. mm -hmm. the way I believe the motion read was to explore it, not to necessarily... Right. I mean, there. Are, if if it's a program that the town is going to do, there'll be ongoing operating costs that would have to be Absolutely. identified and incorporated somehow into a budget. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for the town manager? Okay. Just very quickly, um, on the 20th, uh, we will be voting on Amherst Hills. We also will have uh, people from the Meadows uh, and an update on that. Um, we are checking on another piece of information and it relates to the questions that Councillor Haneke was asking. And that is the process by which we would have to go through to increase our appropriation for the schools. And there may be a vote we have to take that allows us to then do something a month later, but that's legal stuff we're just trying to clarify. Um, and then I also wanted to, people have been mentioning the school track. We've had a discussion earlier in agenda setting and felt it was probably best for the schools to decide what they were going to do and then come to us with the request for the two different pieces of money that we did vote, but they have conditions with them. Okay, one is rotation and the other one is artificial turf. And since they haven't, they have eight options, I believe is what I've seen. And once they decide on the option, then they would request of us for the two different pieces of money, which one of which was free cash and the other one was CPA money. Uh, and then we would have to re-vote. The CPA would have to go to CPA. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and just so people remember, the issue is the wording of both of them attached to a option. So in right. CPA, it was an option three. And then ours, we did say it could be grass or artificial, but it was option two or option three, both which were very specific. Right. And now we've got, as Mandy said, an option that doesn't rotate the track, goes to eight lanes, and looks like we can afford it, but to use either of those monies, that wording ha would have to they be They have to come back to be for us yeah. to, for, in one case, it would have to go to CPA and then come to us for a vote. And the other case, it has to come to us for a revote. Okay. And, and as I understand it, Paul, the free cash side was money as opposed to debt. So a piece of it is That's correct. money. CPA might've been planning on borrowing that money. I don't know what they were planning on the doing. CPA money was debt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Any other agenda requests? Seeing none, I'm going to uh, make a motion to adjourn and seek a second. Shane seconds. Okay. I assume we don't want to debate that. So <laughs> it's not debatable. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, going to go to Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Main, uh, Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Uh, Pam Ernie. Aye. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. It's unanimous. We're adjourned. Thank you.